So, so we see how far we have come. How far we have. In the past, we didn't have PCC, protomic complex concentrates. Protomic complex concentrates have the four factor, the three factor protomic complex concentrates. And it cuts the clotting cascade by up to about 70, 80%. And, and those who have used, for example, uh, PCC knows that uh, reducing INR is faster, it's effective, and it is safer than if you are using FSP. So, so, so when we talk about economic outcome, Dr. Anderson, we can talk about, apart from the cost, the cost of what we call it, of the medicines, uh, we are talking about cost of hospital stay, exposure to other infections, possible uh, reactions that we need to deal with. We are, we are also, uh, what we call it, uh, thinking about, Dr. Anderson, if we, we, we are talking about cost, uh, if, if you process one unit of blood. In the hospital I'm coming from, processing one unit of blood costs 150 Ghana We've not talked about the pre-medication. We've not talked about other things we're going to use for transfer. All right. We've not talked about the extended length of stay in the hospital. We've not talked about possible Thank you. exposure to infection. Thank you. The cost involved is what brings about the overall cost. And if you compare, it is cost-effective to use alternatives to blood Thank you so much. Let's give him a Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no, you you promised I could talk. Now you are trying to cut me. Yes. Uh, uh, One minute. Some, somebody already told you that we are operating in a different environment from where the presentation is coming from. Number one, if a Jehovah Witness fellow, as doctors, come to you in the hospital and is refusing transfusion, take an undertaking from the pest. The fellow should write you. He is concerned that he has agreed that you will not be taking the blood transfusion. Number two, if the fellow dies, the fellow died of suicide. Suicide, the laws of Ghana on suicide contains refusal of blood transfusion. So if it is a severe anemia, death due to severe anemia, the actual diagnosis is suicide. So please, we, we need to... And doctors, you should be covered because now we are clearing the environment and we know what we are talking about. So if you, a doctor, you are called to the, host, uh, the court for as a witness to come out, you must get your terms correct. So the Jehovah witness commits suicide by refusing blood transfusion. Thank you so much. Uh, on the suicidal note, we will end this particular presentation. And uh, it is only relevant and poignant that even on today, we'll have some mental health presentations to deal with the suicidal tendencies. Thank you very, very much. Would like to acknowledge the presence of some uh, important people among us. and health systems planning and policy aspects.
He is the current dean of the University of Ghana Medical School. Please let us welcome Professor Edwin Yosef to the podium. Thank you, Professor Edwin Yosef. Full Professor. Thank you very much. I will stand on the existing protocols that have been established in our setting of the professors. So can we have the slides? That's a few many days. Don't seem to find. Great. Next slide, please, if you can move the slide. So, yeah, quick. please, the content, quick. We're going to quickly look at the health system trying to put in context because of the lecture. And then what makes a resilient health system? What are the ingredients? Then we also look at pertinent issues that are affecting our ability to achieve a resilient system moving towards 2030 and make some policy recommendations. Next slide, please. Next slide. So what is a health system? We all work in the health system and we do what the health system is. The health system basically exists to include all the organizations that provide activities whose primary purpose is to promote, maintain, or restore health. Inherent in this definition, promote, restore, and maintain is the continuum of care. Promotive, preventive, curative, restorative, and rehabilitative, as well as palliative care. So the whole continuum. And the services, individuals, organizations who are involved in providing this constitute the health service. Our system, as we know, is structured along the national political system. Now it is a unitary government, one central government, 16 regions, 275, uh, 75 districts and counting, sub-district and communities where people live. So our system is inherently built to improve assets for persons living at all levels of the healthcare system. And at each level, there are health provision structures as well as health administrative Structuredness. So, how have we provided services over the years? It started with the primary health care in the early 70s, and then we strengthened this using the CHIPS concept, which is the community based health planning concept. And in the 2000s, we started gearing towards the Millennium Development Tool, which created health as a development tool. So, all other agencies came on board. We then introduced the National Health Insurance in August 2003, which we have operated for over 20 years. We are currently in the era of the Sustainable Development Goal, and for us in Ghana, we are using the universal health coverage. To achieve this, we have the universal health coverage roadmap. We also have some benefit package we are developing as we move along. You've gone back, please. Yes, and then we have the health sector medium development plan. So this is generally how our health system functions. Let's go to what a resilient health system is. The resilience of a health system borders on the ability of the system to prepare for, to manage. In managing, it means to be able to absorb shocks, to be able to adapt itself and transform, to be able to manage the shock and to learn very important, from these shocks, so that moving forward, we can be able to face future challenges. So simply put, 
A resilient health system is one that is able to deliver essential health services in the face of shock. So if your system is completely unresilient, then when you are hit by a major shock like COVID, then even essential services, immunization, delivery, and nutritional services will be disrupted. Your system will not be able to manage those essential services. Definitely some high level specialist care will be disrupted, but it is to what extent your system is able to manage the essential system until you are able to come out of it. Let's move on. So the resilience of the system is built on the WHO framework, which has 40, uh, 60 key elements. Governance, financing resources involving human resource, commodities, vaccines, pharmaceuticals, as well as the use of information and technology. So to see how these ingredients constitute or help in a resilience system, let's move this slide. Yes, a resilient health system has participatory leadership that provides a vision, and this vision is translated across all the levels. So a resilient system should have a vision where everybody is working towards. There should be a coordination of activity so that we have efficiency gain. Instead of doing so many things by multiple players and incurring a lot of wastage and cost in the system. So coordination is important. comprehensive package. The essential ones may leave out something, but a resilient system should be comprehensive, such that all important aspects are covered. This is what a resilient system should look like. So let's look, take one example of a COVID, see how we use effective governance and leadership to achieve some resilience during the COVID. Immediately, there was the development of a document that really spelled out how to ensure continuum of care and delivery of essential services, which was brought into, and we all saw the continual engagement of the leadership of the health system, director general, presidential advice, aging the media. There were others who were actively working on the background you never saw, but those were also the people who maintained, who were continuously engaging the regional directors, district directors, so that essential services could, were not disrupted. And this by a fact, I must say, achieved results. Let's see. 
So if you can look at this, or you can see this using a few examples of essential system, antenatal coverage, immunization, and all that. At the end of 2020, when this was done by the Ghana Health Service, Ketsi, Deputy Director General, there was no significant difference in the coverage that were obtained in 2018, 2019, compared to 2020. March, April, May, the system was a little disrupted, but certainly, after a few months, the system was able to reset itself and achieve its target of providing essential services. And therefore, effective leadership governance structures can improve the resilience of the health system. I'm just using this as one example. But there are some things that affect our ability to achieve universal health coverage, and I'm going to quickly highlight and bring our minds to it. This is the nature of the health budget 50 years ago. It was one, done by one of our eminent professors, Professor Okusuama. What it shows here is that about 80% of the healthcare budget was spent on tertiary level and curative care. I can tell you that that architecture, finance architecture over the 50 years hasn't changed dramatically. Um, I'll show a slide that shows that. We introduced the national health insurance. National health insurance in a low income setting has inherent challenges. Income levels are low and therefore there is as much in Pangana from taxes. There is a preponderant population in the informal sector and therefore ability to pay premiums are limited. So it's not surprising that the premiums that are paid constitute about only 5% of the NHS pie. But we may want to increase the premium, but Remember, universal health coverage, one of the goals is making healthcare accessible to all and making finance as a barrier. So if you did that, achieving USC may be a challenge. So we need to look at how to structure our NHI. And we have a lot of persons in the national NHIS who are children below 18 years who really are not potential contributors. So there's a lot of burden. And therefore, how do we finance preventive and promotive care? I want to highlight it for us to avert our minds to it. In our health system, it's as if we are running a parallel finance system. Curative care, hospital-based care, is covered by national health insurance, despite the challenge. How about promotive and prevent, uh, preventive care? Who pays for that? NHIS does not pay for those services. So there are parallel systems. And therefore, it is not surprising that those systems are catered for mainly by partners and donors. But there is a challenge. Let me show you. We did an analysis for the World Bank where we calculated all the resource envelopes that come into the health sector. In 2021, it was clear that 74% of the entire budget is from government, but 26 is from donors and partners. And the 74, the huge volume of money that comes from government, do you know what it is used for? Almost 60% part of that is used to pay for health workers' emolument and salaries. So there is very little left for capital development, infrastructure, and service. And therefore, who pays for the essential services of our system? Does he who pays the piper cause the team? And thus, you cannot achieve a resilient system. We need to enhance domestic mobilization of resources. The architecture is not different from what I showed you 50 years ago. If you look at the one on the bottom right, this Spending in terms of curative care far outweighs promotive care. So going towards 2030, if we are not able to look at this, we've not been able to achieve the 15% target that was set 2001 in Abuja by all governments. We haven't. There is high percent of out-of-pocket payment. People are still outside paying of the NHIS. When donor support, we did the analysis and we saw that going forward, donor support is going to decrease. It was empirical. It was shown. And then the para systems have mentioned it. Preventive and promotive care, mainly driven by donors, 
course, clinical care is mainly via NHIS with all its challenges. I want to highlight that some government policies also inhibit the amount of money the NHIS receives. You know, there is a clean policy such that no matter how much NHIS is able to garner, there is only a limit that is provided back to the NHIS. And these are systems we need to look at right from the top. There are some policies that will not enable us to achieve universal health coverage. When we look at human resource, I will just highlight that we have some systems in place that can train almost all the cadre of staff we need, specialists, nurses, doctors, due to the establishment of the colleagues. That is very good. However, the distribution is always challenging. Let me show you just one example. From 2013, for nurses, we have been able to achieve the population to nurse ratio. What we need to do going forward is to train specialist nurses, critical care, emergency nurses, palliative care, geriatric nurses, those areas that are of most need, not only general nurses. For doctors, we are still struggling to achieve the target. In 2013, if you look at the greater Accra, which was the best region, was one doctor is to 30,000 or so population. In the same country elsewhere, one doctor was taking care of 53,000 population. I don't want to mention the region. So if you do a little ratio, it shows that for the same standard population in Accra or greater Accra, where there will be 17 doctors available, elsewhere in the country for the same standard population, there is only one doctor. And this is grossly in epitaph when we cannot achieve universal health coverage for a resilient system by this. So inequitable distribution, skilled personnel, as I said, and also there should be donor a, a demand driven even into our schools. Which areas are we lacking such that we encourage people to go into those specialty areas for both nurses, doctors, not blanket enrollment, everybody wanting to be a specialist and therefore we give opportunity for that. We, we need to look at that. I don't think there is any manager here who can tell us that since January, he's not lost a doctor, a nurse, pharmacy, or something to our colleagues in the West, especially to UK and others. It is alarming and becoming grievous, especially because of Brexit and COVID-19. And these are areas we need to look at. Just a little on health access to make my colleagues in the private sector happy. The private sector, if we put CHAG and others together, contribute to about 40% of all the cases seen at the out outpatient. And therefore, if your national health system has such a contribution from the public sector, you cannot ignore the public sector during your planning. And therefore, the public sector, uh, the private sector should be involved actively in everything that we do. It is not only during COVID that we will harness the capacity of the private sector to build a hundred capacity facility. We should be able to encourage them to do this even during normal health system. Chips, we have been able over the years to improve a lot of functional chips across. That's a gateway to entry into the health system. That is very good. But the package of care that is delivered at the lower level is what is being looked at. It has traditionally concentrated on maternal and child health, neglecting NCDs and mental health and other related events. Fortunately, the Ghana Health and Ministry of Health is looking at the packing. We also saw that the middle level, that is the health center, was the weakest link. And we cannot achieve if we don't strengthen that level. So fortunately, there is the network of practice is trying to strengthen the sub-district level. And we are developing the essential healthcare benefit package, which have been developed, and can guide us as to where to push the interest and also the UX roadmap. So limited prioritization of services and barriers to assets. Before senior comes to talk about Agenda 111, I want to highlight that, that it is important we look at that. In access to health care, we say that quantity has a quality of its own. You provide the access 
by providing access alone, that is a good quality of the healthcare system. And then going forward, we look at the functionality, efficiency, and all that. So I want to repeat, T in healthcare access is a quality or has a quality of its own. So before senior comes, I've done a little of his job for him. Sorry. Yeah. Health information technology we need to use, I mentioned that improve data management, adoption of technology, and research. Ghana Health Service has at least three research stations, Navrongo, Kitam, Udwa. How much of this research really translates and guide the policy of the Ministry of Health, Ghana Health Service, let alone those from the universities and academia? We need to have a coordinated use of research to inform national policy. That will make our system resilient. Sorry. I want to highlight a few population level risks we need to look at so that we can achieve universal health coverage. The first is aging. In sub-Saharan Africa, Ghana is reputed to be one of the countries with the highest proportion of those 60 years and above. And therefore, going forward, we need to look at the care of the aged. As I mentioned, geriatric care, palliative care will come in. Pension payments. It's a social policy we need to look at. If people are going to live longer, then they will need to have benefits that will make them live comfortable, economically productive life after their pensions. Obesity, which is a high risk for most of the non-communicable diseases, has been shown to be increasing. In a nationwide survey done in 2007, another in 2014, there was a great percentage point increase in prevalence of obesity across board. We are conducting another survey, which is also a seven-year period, to see how the rates are. And it is primarily among urban residents, older persons, those with higher education, and those with higher income. So, Mr. President, GMA, I would then say that your audience here, the population here, are most at risk of being obese. Not necessarily because they are high income earners, because we are not but because they are highly educated. I believe that one, you agree with me on that. Yes. We are fighting for conditions of service and all that to improve that other aspect. The next one, interestingly, is the prevalence of non-communicable disease. When people were asked whether you know if you had hypertension or not, only about 16% of the entire population of about 28,000 said, they knew they had hypertension. When actual BPs were checked, it was almost more than 50%. So it means so many people are walking around not knowing what they are carrying about. And these are risks that will manifest with time. And then you see other prevalences there. These are things we need to look at. I want to give an interesting exposition here. Do you know how much when we did the analysis of the resource envelope, it's a problem, but it's not a fixed thing. When we were spending about 54 million on malaria, do you know how much you were spending directly on mental health and non-communicable diseases? It was 1 million or less. So priorities, you cannot achieve universal health coverage when the priorities are not in the right direction. We are not saying withdraw money from malaria infection disease because we know that the gains that we have made, malaria, TB, HIV, can be leveraged on using the same systems to improve non-communicable diseases. When you have dot centers scattered all across, can't we use the dot centers to also screen for some chronic respiratory diseases, which is currently not being done? Just using a few short questionnaire. Every question, uh, patient, um, a short questionnaire, apart from screening them from TB, we can also screen them from some chronic respiratory diseases. As for hypertension, diabetes, and others, we can always directly test for it. So these are systems we need to continue to build. So in summarizing the social problems, you say aging is becoming common. Rural residents are worse off in access to healthcare. I didn't give you all the things because of lack of time. Urban residents and those with higher income suffer more chronic conditions, 
because of our lifestyle, isn't it? Yes, we don't do as much as older women are poorer, more likely to be widowed and have more chronic conditions. And we need to always look at that. Another one we shouldn't forget is the older man. Sometimes we tend to forget about the older man. When the children are doing well in the cities and they want somebody to come and live with them, they will call the grandma. They won't call grandpa who will come and be carrying his catheter around and be a burden to everybody. Grandma, no matter the age, can still bath the children and get them ready for school. So don't forget the older man, especially the rural dwelling older man. So let's end by giving a few policy recommendations. We have done the universal health coverage roadmap. We need to operationalize it. In there is the health benefit package and all that that we are looking at. We need to give it priority and a pride of place. We need to restructure the package that is delivered at a very low level to include non-communicable diseases, basic screening for NCDs, and this we hope to achieve using the network of practice, which will facilitate services through enhanced coordinated network. I told you a resilient system is where coordination is strong. So even at the low level, we need to achieve some level of coordination and then essential health package is key. We need to strengthen human resource base. I don't know how, what we can do to stem the tide of the exodus of health workers. That is a national level policy that we need a dialogue. But for our training institutions, as I said, it should be demand driven. Much of what we need should inform how many cadre or staff we train. And it shouldn't be so traditional approach to recruit, to train, to hire and deploy health workers should be looked at if we are to achieve universal health coverage. MA has always been talking about rural incentives and all that. I don't know how far we've gone in that direction, but that is really, really very important. Involve the private sector and other players. I mentioned that, especially in research, service delivery. Private practice provide a lot of support for outpatient care, especially, and we need to encourage that. Involve them in the planning and all national key documents. We need to strengthen our surveillance systems, not only for infectious diseases, but also for non-communicable diseases. This is what will help us identify the shocks before they become big enough to affect the health system. We need to strengthen our surveillance systems. And then quality is something we always tend to forget. We are going to develop the second edition of the National Healthcare Quality Strategy. The first, in fact, was heavily focused on health service delivery. But there are others, regulators, institutions, research institutes, they should also have some quality measurement to assess their services. And the ministry is going to do that. That is very important. Domestic funding is important. So despite the economic challenges, whenever we are able to achieve economic recovery, the policy, Ghana Beyond Aid, should be looked at. It is important so that money funds will be available to, for domestic mobilization to support, especially improvement of the national health insurance, get them all the, at least the little money they make, let government release it back to them and also have some money to support preventive and promotive service. I think that's it. I hope I worked in time. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Prof, you have a question. Wait, Prof, you have a question. Resilience health system. Resilient, resilient health system, you actually highlighted most of the points, but we need data. Data. 
the country now, Ghana, we have the poor, our health system is poor. According to WHO, we are 135th out of 194 countries in the world. Prof, basing everything, we base on health, we base on data. Data, we don't have data. Our denominator is poor. Everything is OPD attendance. We have to go to prevalence. Prevalence. We present with OPD attendance. So I think it's long time we move to address the denominator issue. I have to say this because I'm leaving immediately to Accra to attend the funeral of the former minister. So I have to ask you this question. I know we don't have time. So with respect, I'll end here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Doc. Um, in fact, there are many vets issues, but that is why we have allocated full time to discuss some of the data issues. And we are very grateful for that point. So we'll move on quickly to the next presentation. Thank you very much. Our next presentation will be taken by an alumnus of Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology and a member of the Ghana College of Physicians and Surgeons in the field of adult psychiatry. She is a lecturer of behavioral sciences and a senior specialist and head of department of Kwame Nkrumah uh, Teaching Hospital, the psychiatric department. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Dr. Ruth Owusu Enchi to do the next presentation for us on the topic, optimizing the mental well-being of the health worker. Thank you very much. Welcome. Good morning to you all. I would also stand on all existing protocols. Can I have my slide? I'm really grateful to the organizers of the CPD that we have the opportunity to talk about our mental health. It is my passion. And I've always wanted that as we take care of people, who should take care of us. And when I talk about this subject uh, among health professionals, I usually that it who watches over the watchman. As we are watching over everybody else, who watches? I hope that uh, by the end of my presentation, we would have picked up some insights and some thoughts on how we can better develop our mental world. We are having some technical issues, but um, when I have this opportunity for there to be any technical issue, I usually run a quick poll. So maybe let's use two minutes uh, to answer a few questions, just five questions about our own mental health. So you can answer on your phone or uh, on the sheets of papers with you. 
uh, the first question I was asked is that I do not have at least seven hours of sleep every day for you. Is it true or false? This is, this is a, a unanimous yes. We are confessing. Okay. The second question is, I do not eat at least two hot balanced meals a day. This one, a lady will answer. Is it true or false? True. 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 Hmm. It's true. Hey. Okay. <laughs> The, the third question is... Let me go on the other side. I easily get irritated with the people I live with. Ah, the ONG about sections. money issues. This one asks the men about money issues. No, no, I don't get, I don't get irritated. <laughs> if they come to ask for money to buy bread, money to pay school fees, money to buy textbooks. No. Dr. Ruth, you get ir easily irritated. someone whispered to me that even the question is irritating him. <laughs> Is another two. Hmm. <laughs> then the, the, the fourth, right? The fourth question is the question is by us. Okay, both men and women. The fourth question is I am in an unstable relationship and sometimes I think I've lost out. Um, I, I have run out of love for my partner. I am in an unstable relationship. You are um, in the relationship, all right, but you sometimes think Dr. Uzuenki, you have... Um, I need to save the people. <laughs> and uh, you see, God works in mysterious ways. Because of this question, the presentation has come. <laughs> uh, I don't know how that works, but... Someone uh, has been we, saved. Uh, we, we can't answer this question. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, um, if you answer true to any of these questions, you probably are too stressed out. That is not the full extent of the questions, but it should give you an idea where you stand in terms of your stress levels. Well, so let's go to the business of today, optimizing the mental well-being of the health worker. So optimizing the mental well-being of the health worker. What is mental health even in the first place? This definition is very common. WHO says that mental health is a state of well-being in which a person can fully live, can manage stress, and I'll put that in red because I'll come to it. It's able to work well and contribute meaningfully to their society. And this means that the individual is able to involve themselves in productive activities. They can be in fulfilling relationships with people and they can adapt to change whenever there is. Now, the point in red signifies the fact that being in good mental health or in good uh, mental well-being means that you should be able to manage your stress. And that also means that stress is normal. And once we are on this earth, we will be faced with several stresses from diverse quarters in our lives. But it is an individual's inability to manage and handle their stresses that may tip them into mental ill health. Now, when we are unable to handle our stresses, or we ignore them. And I have said we allow because 
we are primarily responsible for our own mental health. So if we allow the stress to accumulate and they pile up one upon the other, you are aiming for your leave that is coming around the, 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 the next month and hoping that, okay, I'll rest during that time. And lo and behold, the leave comes and you are still juggling between a lot of things. And so you are not resting and stress is piling up. What happens is that you begin to head off the rails. Your mental health is compromised. And as you lay one stone of stress upon the other, one day, one last straw will break the camel's back. And before you realize, you topple down into mental breakdown. Interestingly, mental disorders are no respecter of persons, no populations. And our social class, our vocation as uh, health professionals, our social standing does not pr protect us from mental breakdown. There are biological and environmental factors that may come together to tip someone into mental breakdown. And some people biologically may have a predisposition to mental illness and when there's a family history already. But until environmental stresses come to play, the person will be fine. When environmental issues in the form of stresses come in, that is when we eventually break down. But why should we even talk about mental well-being? What actually is the magnitude of the problem? All over the world, it's been found out that there are issues with the mental health of physicians. Interestingly, there is no evidence that at the point of entry to medical schools, they deliberately admit people who are prone to mental disorders. No. At the entry into medical school, the mental health in studies that has been done, the mental health of the students are at par with other students in other departments and even the general population. Unfortunately, just by the end of the first year, the students' mental states in the medical school are significantly worse than their colleagues in other departments and in the general population. And the stress builds and accumulates throughout their schools, their school life, and even throughout their working life. That is not all. Can you be changing the slides for me? I'm unable to change. That is not all. Although the physician's physical health, through many researches that has been done, has proven that the physician's physical health is usually better than the general population, that of their mental health is totally low when you compare to the general population. As many as about a third doctors are believed, a third of doctors worldwide, are believed to suffer from a form of mental disorder. And this was from um, a study done by British Medical Association. Another study found out that almost 60% of about 2,000 doctors that were surveyed were living with some mental illness. Aside that, substance misuse or substance abuse has been frequently reported to be commoner among doctors than the general uh, population. More data is telling us that female doctors are two times more likely to suffer from depression. Already in the general population, females are twice as prone to depression than males. When we come into the, uh, the fiscal or the, the, the health professional, then the female doctor is two times prone to suffering from depression than the general population. Again, rates of suicide among doctors have been found in several studies to be higher than the general population. Initially, this um, suicide rate was grouped according to specialties, and they said that psychiatrists are more prone to die by suicide. <laughs> Let me learn. <laughs> Let me learn. Those were those were the old those were the old studies that said that. A psychiatrist were likely to die by suicide, and a pediatrician at the least likely to die by suicide. But don't be too excited yet. <laughs> don't be too excited yet. The recent and the most current studies are saying that there is no difference in the suicide rate across the specialties. Now we have all leveled out. <laughs> 
<laughs> the, it's also been found out that the completion rate of suicide among health professionals is high. Probably because we know just which medication is lethal or which means is lethal. And sometimes because of our access to some of these uh, drugs, it makes completion of suicide among the uh, health professionals also higher. Now, this is just um, some anecdotal figures from my consulting room. Together with just a few of my colleagues, we decided to just put our heads together and try to remember how many patients who are our colleagues we see with the various common diagnosis. And when you sum up all these, it gets to almost 96 or something. Depression, doctors with depression, we are treating about 20, bipolar 12, schizophrenia about 12. Addiction, interestingly, there's a new wave of addiction coming up. The initial addiction we feared and were worried about among health professionals was opiate addiction which is still worrying as a psychiatrist. Um, the substance, one substance that I fear most is opiates. I think it is way dangerous than cocaine and molly and all the other things because of its fast rate as at addicted. You need to use opiates for just two consistent weeks and then you are addicted to it. People can use marijuana for years, but the day they decide to stop because they are not physically addicted to it, stopping is easier or pitting is easier. But when it comes to it, just two weeks, 14 days, you are addicted. And unfortunately, some of us um, itrogenically cause addiction, opiate addiction in many of our patients because they are coming with uh, sickle cell crisis or some migraine or post-op pain. And you are tired of their complain. So every now and then you're giving one shot, 50 milligrams IV, 50 milligrams IM. And before you realize that your patient, you don't see again, don't think that um, their pain has been relieved. They have found their own way to the pharmacies to purchase it. But there is gambling addiction also coming up. And you wonder why monies for health professionals don't seem to be enough for them and they want to gamble and get some more and gamble and get some more. I have described some risk factors in a certain and that probably may account for that. So we are getting a lot of um, young health professionals also with um, gambling addiction. They are deeply rooted in it. It's made them suicidal. They can't bring themselves out of it because they are in huge um, debt. And I'm thinking if about 90 Doctors are being seen by just about five psychiatrists. Now we have about 70 psychiatrists. If you multiply this by the number of psychiatrists, it would only give you an idea, the number of um, health professionals who may be dealing with some health uh, med mental health challenges. Again, the diagram on the, on the other side, the pie chart on that side, um, is a preliminary result of a study we are doing at Convanochi Teaching Hospital. We decided to put this survey out during our uh, World Mental Health Awareness Month to measure the burnout or otherwise the stress levels of staff. And this was across board, um, doctors, nurses, laboratory uh, uh, people, everybody that works in the hospital. And we are realizing that those in the red are those who were severely stressed and that accounted for 26% of all the staff. And that is not surprising. It's actually very consistent with the data WHO has given worldwide that one out of every four people will suffer from mental disorder at some point in their life. That is about 25%. And we've got 26% um, who are severely stressed. And I have already mentioned that stress is the number one risk factor for mental breakdown. And so if 25 or 26 people are severely stressed, they are just at the verge of breaking down or they already have broken down diagnosable mental disorders. There are several risk factors that we can identify specifically in the medical field that predispose doctors to mental breakdown. And I would run through a few of them. The first one is the fact that as health professionals, we, we work at the interface between life and death. It's either your patient is doing well or you're losing them. 
And that alone can be emotionally draining. And I always bear with my colleagues who especially work at the emergency. Uh, people are passing through their hands in the course of one shift and you're losing a lot of them. Some are going into a very critical stage, have to be at the ICU and all that. And how do you juggle between all of this? Um, seeing so many people dying on your hands, you may be a, a pediatric oncologist, um, you may be um, an obstetrician, gynecologist, you may be a surgeon, whichever specialty you work in. The fact that there is that chance that people will die at your hands in itself is very uh, distressing. And we, 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 on a daily basis, have to cope with these intense emotions. Um, sometimes these patients are demanding, wanting our time. Someone was just telling me that at 4 a.m. she's getting a call from the hospital. I have been seen by you. She said, I am on leave. And they can't take it. They still want you to make an input. And you go through all of these things and some way, somehow, you don't have to cry at the death of each patient, although some do cry. But how are you able to compartmentalize your emotions so that this is my patient, I, I am not supposed to be crying. And yet you see another woman, it's probably now your mother or your auntie, who also dies. And that one, you need to feel that emotion cry. So it's a whole lot of emotional jumble that we have to go through day in and day out as physicians and as medical professionals. Again, one of the risk factors is the fact that there is role overload. There are a lot of expectations um, that sometimes exceed our abilities, especially for young colleagues. House officer comes in fresh from school and then you are put on duty or you are the one in the consulting room. How to now convert the theory you knew into practice. You are seeing now a live patient that you should, be, uh, you should manage. There is also work overload because of relative shortage of health professionals. And then the role conflict, um, having to be the one to be responsible for making that decision. There is only one ventilator. Which patient do I put on the ventilator? Which one do I take up? Um, which do I save? Which one do I not save? Can all be stressful. Again, the risk of neglect of our own families and our own selves. We are most of the time very busy. Even when we are not well, we forget about our own wellness and we go and take care of other people. We self-prescribe. We refuse to join the queue or sit in the consulting rooms and go and see our colleagues for our own ailments. Now, I have many of the doctors who come to me in the consulting room. I said, go and prepare a folder. Let us see you so that we can get a documented record of your care. But they don't want it. They want to come behind the door come after clinic, I don't want to make a folder, let me talk to you on phone and all that. I see colleague doctors also. Whether I'm going myself or I'm going with my child, I always ensure that I have registered on my links, I have my card, I have my OPD number. I think it's a better way to get the care. Again, there is that personal trait of perfectionism amongst um, doctors. And, we, and that has been confirmed in several um, studies. And because of that, we believe that when we make errors, we can't forgive ourselves. And of course, if you are health professionals and you make errors, it may be costing somebody's life. And so sometimes we are unable to forgive ourselves when deep within you, you know that that patient died because you gave the medication ID instead of I. Nobody may find out, but that guilt probably never leaves you. Doctors are also depicted in the culture, in the, in the community as people who never fail or never get ill. And so getting ill or, or even reporting in sex sometimes uh, feels that you are weak. Poor working environment, inadequate or limited access to tools and materials that you need. We travel out and we see that if we had these gadgets, these machines, we could do better. You come back home and they are no longer there. And then poverty and over-reliance by the family and extended family on us. Once you are the doctor in the family, you are in trouble. Everybody is coming with their child school fees. That auntie is coming. Give me some capital to start my business. And I have come to, um, I have gotten to a point where I had to virtually show my pay slip to a family member. and said, look, as a young house officer, I was taking just about 900 cities. And the person was shocked. Oh, really? We thought doctors were very rich. Um, if you get into troubles like that, sometimes prove to them that you cannot answer all the questions. And then there's disciplinary sanctions that, Similarly, um, it's present amongst 
the health professional that if you are found with an addiction problem, there is the tendency to receive disciplinary actions rather than get some care. Now things are gradually changing because I know MDC um, um, has a subcommittee that takes care of such things, but it has not settled amongst all of us in our workplaces. If you are found abusing alcohol or you come to work drunk or you come um, to work and they find out that you have injected petadine or morphine, usually the first thing is that you will be sanctioned. But let's remember that addiction is also a mental health problem and it should be addressed with the same emergencies that we would address a, a hypoglycemic emergency or some other disorders. And this is some of the pictures I got from our OPDs. Patients lying on the floor, you have to sometimes jump over some of them to be able to take care of uh, them. But in the midst of all this, we ask ourselves, what doctors even tell if they really had mental breakdown? Looking at all the statistics, what they, are they prepared to tell? A US study also assessed 2,000 doctors and they realized that just about half of them who indeed had suffered from mental disorders, diagnosable mental disorders reported or sought help. Less than 10% of Ghanaian doctors also, these are just anecdotal um, uh, figures, have actually sought help for themselves. What are some of the reasons, please, back? What are some of the reasons why doctors would not seek help? Stigma. And the stigma comes from you and I. Sometimes the reason is that there is no time. Sometimes the reason is that seeking help will depict that you are weak. And without mentioning names, there's been a lot of, some of these issues on social media pages, on the doctor's pages, junior doctor's pages, Facebook pages, when People, other colleagues are saying, look, I don't have a mental problem and they have diagnosed me mental problem. And it can be very, very sad that these are doctors who probably had psychiatry lectures. And they are thinking that the fact that the person can type one or two sentences on social media alone is enough to say that they don't have any mental disorder. And they are rather supporting them. And this is somebody who has seen about 10 different psychiatrists it's amazing how all these psychiatrists can connive and say that we want to put schizophrenia on you by all means. What are we going to gain from that? And I hope that those conversations will change and rather encourage such a person. My brother, my sister, it is not a death warrant to have a mental diagnosis or a mental health diagnosis. We will support you to get help rather than they didn't do well. You don't have this person typing nicely. Coherently, how can he have any mental disorder? Please, let us be informed so that we can give informed support to our colleagues. What is the consequences? If people are going through mental health challenges and because of stigma and because of various reasons they cannot get help, what's the consequence? Many diagnose and attempt to treat themselves. Some try to seek VIP treatment from colleagues and most of the time there are no follow-ups. And many of the doctors who can appreciate that they are going through mental health challenges sometimes decide to go on and ignore their problems altogether. Next slide. And when that happens, and you go to consulting room A, there is this doctor going through maybe schizophrenia or depression or anxiety and they are not getting help. What happens? you are more likely to be causing harm rather than causing health or helping your patients that come to you. There's reduced workplace productivity, there is reduced efficiency, and a lot of presenteeism. So people are presenting at work, but work output is zero. Then it can result in pathological cynicism, and they are there, they are, un they are unwilling to care for the chronically ill. That patient is wailing on, on bed A, that patient is calling out on bed C and they are sitting at the doctor's desk. They can hear, they can't be bothered. There is decreased empathy. And sometimes, eventually because help is not sought early, 
these doctors eventually obviously break down. And when one doctor is moved away from practice, another has to be replaced. It's a cost to the country. Another consequence of not seeking help is what we call the compassion fatigue. Compassion fatigue is a state of exhaustion and um, dysfunction whereby the doctor becomes helpless. They are confused. They are perpetually exhausted and they always feel overwhelmed at work. Next. So what must we do to ensure that the doctor is in good mental well-being. We know that adults spend majority of their time or their 24 hours at the workplace. And so most of some of these things we have to do must happen um, at the workplace. When we invest in mental well-being, we are able to save about 2 to $4 in every $1 that we put in to prevent and mental health challenges. And so the cost of doing nothing has been found to be more expensive than doing something. Up to date, the largest study that has been done to study physicians' mental well-being has said Sleeping at, at night or when there is darkness is always better. It's always um, quality than when you sleep in the daytime. So some people have asked, okay, what if I work better at night? So I want to sleep during the day. The quality of sleep during the day and the night are totally different. And science has clearly proven that the darkness around us in itself shapes our or shifts our biological sleep switch to the sleep mode. Unless during the daytime, you can actually create a night scenario around you. Otherwise, there are five stages of sleep. You are probably uh, hovering around stage one and two, one and two. You are not going deep until you are going to the deepest portions, four and five of the sleep. Your sleep is never restful enough. Aside that, nutrition has also been found to be very good, uh, very important. Studies say that if we're able to eat at least two hot and balanced meals a day, not the Coke and Fanta and um, some pie you send people to get for you, the snacks, or that, um, what do you call it, roasted yam, or sometimes uh, that check check we are eating at work all the time. Make sure that your meals have enough fruits, they have enough vegetables, and you avoid unprocessed uh, whole foods. Stay hydrated with plenty of water, and um, arguably, the addition of nutritional supplements after about age 50 is really touching us. That you could add on and some multivitamins routinely to make up for the lost nutrition you're unable to take daily. And then exercising is also very key. And it's, it's not just any exercising. Some people say, oh, but I walk to the lab and I go and collect blood 10 times in the day. That is not exercising. This one is exercising to the point of perspiration about three to four times in the week. And um, the Public Health Agency of Canada said that if we can exercise up to 150 minutes in the week, so you can break that down into three or four days in the week, and it should be to the point of perspiration. So if you are not sweating, 
uh, you are not breaking through your stress levels yet. In addition to these things, let us make it part of our lifestyle to take short breaks during work. Don't sit in your chair all the eight hours you are working. You work for two hours, you get up small, take about five minutes of work. Forget about that patient sitting outside and screaming and saying, Dr. Your chair and all that. You should take care of your own mental health. Just five minutes break, walk around, make that call you wanted to make, take some water, come back and sit down. Do that about two to three times in your eight hour shift. Make time for leisure activities and pamper yourself. Some of the us don't travel any time outside of our region unless it is GMA, AGM. Please advise yourself. And again, don't wait till it's your birthday or it is Valentine that you are expecting someone to pamper you or take you out. Please pamper yourselves. Doctors, pamper yourself. And it should not be necessarily an occasion. Walk into those of us in Kumasi with me. Golden Bean or now Lancaster, I'm sure they do buffet breakfast. Decide one day that I'm not eating my usual gobe or uh, jollof from Auntie Mansa. I'm going to sit down and pay some 200 cities for a buffet lunch. It's no occasion. It's just a day to pamper yourself and it's been found to be uh, very helpful. And then make reduce maladaptive coping mechanisms. If you are stressed, let's rest instead of deciding to take in excessive alcohol or resort to smoking, let us set appropriate limits for ourselves. The fact that you live in a community and your neighbors know you are a doctor does not mean that they should call you at all hours when you are sleeping. I've had patients call me at the early stage of my practice and around midnight, they call me and say, doctor, I can't sleep. And they just woke you up to join them in their inability to sleep. So for now, after some time, I don't pay calls. And that is very important. Make sure that there is somebody on night cover for you who would take emergency calls. But you have to set time limits on yourself. Otherwise, if you avail yourself as perpetually available, the patient would always use you. Develop the body system. And those of us who do and render employee assistance programs to institutions and companies, this is one thing. Uh, we promote a lot the body system i don't know how gma will take it up but everybody in the company or in the institution identifies one person they call the buddy or the friend and you tell them this is me i give you the permission to tell me when i'm not feeling well when you see that nowadays my behavior is going some way i give you the permission to tell me because sometimes people are worried to inform or talk about people's mental health because they are afraid the other person may be thinking, hey, a few say, my brother, man. But if you give the person your permission, they watch your back, you watch their back. If you see that nowadays I've become irritable, I come to work, I'm dozing, my work output has changed. Look, I give you permission to tell me, and it helps. We are able to resort the problems well. And then keeping a gratitude journal has been found to be very helpful. It's been found out that it's almost impossible to be grateful and to be anxious at the same time. So every morning you wake up, you just think about three things you are grateful to God for. What can I thank God for today? And as your mind is thinking and trying to locate something positive, you seem to move or shift your thoughts from your problems to rather being grateful. Um, again, please, next slide. It's necessary that we keep a mental health friendly workplace. And this is the responsibility of all of us, especially those of us who are um, leaders in managerial roles in our workplaces. Mental health friendly workplaces are those that value the health of their employees, including their mental health and well being. And they have specific practices and policy in place. These policies and practices should include treating mental illness with the same agency as physical illness. Promoting work-life balance. Not that it's somebody's leave and you say, Charlie, stay in for me for uh, two weeks. Oh, can you uh, defer your leave? No, respect that people will have to take a break. Mental health-friendly workplaces provide training for managers and supervisors so that they can identify mental health issues at the workplace. And in addition, mental health work and uh, mental health-friendly places support employees in seeking treatment and so you don't just identify that this one has an addiction problem the 
hospital or the institution or the department is ready to say that we vote this amount of money to support you to go to rehab. Uh, we give you time off work with pay for you to get your mental health treatment. These are some of the policies at part. We have a drug policy. Thankfully, HR involved the psychiatry unit. Initially, when we look at the policy, it was all punitive. When you are caught at work smoking, when you are, you, 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 we catch you drinking at work, and blah, 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 we'll dismiss you and we'll do it. And we say, no, 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 that approach is wrong. We need to identify that these are illnesses. And if, you, if someone collapses as a result of hypoglycemia at work, and you will not dismiss them, the same way if you catch them drinking at work or smoking or injecting themselves, that same agency you will give to the hypoglycemic patient should be given to that person so that they get the right help. Next. Fortunately, there are a lot of advancement that has taken place in psychiatry and mental health, such that our treatments have been found to be very effective. And it's because they are efficacious, they are tolerable, and adherence is easy. The third line that has been added is adherence, because now, especially for our antipsychotics, you can get one, three monthly injections, very, very convenient, so that in the whole year, you are just getting four injections quarterly, which will adequately man uh, manage your schizophrenia, your psychosis, schizoaffective disorders, and all that. And um, there are advancements in treatment. And the goal of the psychiatrist is now, just like the cardiologist, when we diagnose you first, ensure that you don't break down or you don't relapse. And so there are very, very new uh, medications and treatment modalities that nobody should have, be afraid uh, to seek help. As if if I take the Lagatel, I'll be dozing and I'll be slow. No, no. We have moved away from the Lagatel era. And there are more designer psychiatric medications and treatments for us. In other places, they have resources um, that support their association members. They provide direct help. Some people have short codes to three lines and all that. And I know that the current administration is doing well. They have actually put together a team, um, a committee called Mental Health for Doctors, that we are coming up with so many things that will address the mental health needs of our members. So in summary, mental health of physicians affect the health of practitioners and the sustainability of the healthcare system as a whole. And addressing the issues should be a priority for medical schools, teaching hospitals, health facilities, professionals, association, and even uh, the government. Next slide, please. I'll leave us with these 10 commandments I have couched um, for uh, taking home. The first commandment says that thou shalt not expect someone else to reduce your stress. It is your own responsibility. Commandment two, thou shalt not resist change. Third commandment, thou shalt not look down on thyself. Fourth commandment, remember your purpose on earth and work towards it. Fifth commandment, honor thy limits. The sixth commandment, thou shalt not work alone, delegate. Commandment seven, thou shalt not publish. Thou shalt publish, but not perish for those of us in academia. The eighth commandment is, thou shalt not work harder, but thou shalt work smarter. The ninth commandment, seek to find joy and mastery in thy work. And the tenth commandment is, thou shalt continue to learn. And I say that now that you know all these things, blessed are you if you do them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Enchi. We are really grateful. Well, MC, uh, what is your mental health status like? Thou shalt learn. I saw Dr. Uh, Prof. Hesse when they said thou shalt publish but not perish. He was there. I was like, so uh, this one is what they say. Obia dear womb. You know, no way you would, dear. Professors are not perishing. So they are taking this. Uh, I saw my president also smiling. The stress on us as executives. Uh, 
I think after this, we'll have an evening session where we take our therapy session. Uh, the burnout is too much. So right now we are roasted. Um, we will move on, but there's a few quick things. We have snack ready, but because we had some challenges with time, what we we'll do is that we'll have some people usher us out in batches so that we'll continue the program and finish on time. Uh, remember this afternoon we'll have a session for manifestos where we can grill as the candidates except me um as the mc i can uh, take myself out of the grilling and then also interact and get what the vision is for the association which is an important session so we will need to save some time so please we'll be ushered out in batches and also for those who are yet to register and the place is clearing up a bit, so we would also urge you, kindly note that this door on this side will be out of use. You will use the back one so that we don't disturb the presentations. Our next one will come online, so we would have that. And then after that, the last presentation, then we'll have a panel discussion where we can field all our questions for a more interactive and an engaging session. So that is just by way of just the next few steps that we'll be having. So my co-MC, who is very bent out, uh, please take over. Okay, Richard, are you sure Dr. Intree will be happy with us the way we are taking the snack? Because we need to take care of ourselves, like make time to eat mindfully. <laughs> okay, so... Please, uh, one quick one, uh, which may also lead to extra stress, but uh, you have to pardon us. Please remember to take your coupons along. They are in your bags. They are, they are supposed to be in your bag, so, all right. Thank you. How about those of us who didn't bring our bag? <laughs> like me. We'll manage the stress. So please, we will continue with the presentations. We will deal with the administrative issues in the background. Please pardon us. All right. Our next presentation will be taken by our own Deputy Director General of Ghana Health Service, Dr. Anthony Adolfo Ofosu. Dr. Ofosu is a member of the Ghana Medical Association, and he's worked so many years in the rural districts in Ahafo, Bono Ahafo then. And this morning, he's going to take us on practical approaches or solutions to the health needs of the health worker. So he's going to give us the practical approaches that we all need so that we'll be able to address our own health needs. So ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Dr. Anthony Ofosu. He's going to do the presentation online. You come in online. Please let us welcome him. Let's clap and welcome him. Okay. Yeah, Please, Th Dr. thank, Dr. thank, thank ready. you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please let's so, move out silently. Hello, can I continue? Can you hear me? Hello, can I be heard? Hello. Okay, so I thank you. Good morning, everyone. So I'm making a presentation on the practical approaches, solutions to address the health needs of the health worker. And this is the outline of my presentation. So I'll talk about the introduction, then the preventive services, mental and physical. 
uh, the curative services. That is breaking it up with dealing with medical condition covered by the NHI, dealing with medical condition outside no, the no, no, benefit it's, package. It's okay. And then it's okay. I'll conclude. Please, can you hear me? Okay. So please, so, when we go for the snack, let's do our best to come back quickly. Thank you. And uh, even the yeah. Zoom is undergoing stress. Can, can you hear me, please? Or oh, we're on snack break. Okay. Come on. Come on. Hello, 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 Yes, so, so addressing, I'll talk about addressing the health needs of the health And broadly, all the facets of health that we're talking about, that health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. But then, so... Basically, the mental and physical health are probably the two most frequently discussed types of health that we talk about. Of course, spiritual, emotional, financial health also contribute to the overall health of a person. And then also, I mean, yeah. medical yes. experts have linked this to lower stress levels and improve mental and physical well-being. And I think we just listened to the presentation on mental health, and I think it's it's good that it's coming just before I present it, because it has dealt with some of the issues that I will have talked about. And then, of course, people with better financial health, for example, do not worry about finances, and they have means to buy fresh food regularly. I mean, and then those also with good spiritual health may feel a sense of calm and purpose that fuel, fuels good mental health also. Right. So one of the things that we need to look at is creating a good working environment creating a good working environment for mental health. Start. And especially managers at all levels should try and create a conducive working environment for their staff. It's very important that the work environment where we spend about eight hours is not toxic. And there are small, small things that managers can do to make that possible. You should learn to exhibit empathy towards your staff, to show concern about their personal development, their anxieties, their worries about changes in their organization, their promotion, their salaries. I mean, all those things are critical in the way that the person then feel valued in the organization and then feel able to contribute. Staff should be treated with respect and dignity as human beings and not as input for productivity. Sometimes we forget that, I mean, uh, th these are people with emotions, with fears, with anxieties, and that they bring to the workplace. And managers need to manage them in a way that they are able to give up their best with all the things that we need to deal with, their egos, their anger problems, their fears and anxieties. And yeah. those with mental health challenges should be identified as support. Yeah. yeah. So I think those are the critical things when it comes to the mental health aspect of it. Yeah, that we need to look at creating a good work environment for the staff. And then physical health. One of the things also that we talk about nutrition, sometimes even the place where people work Getting good food to buy is a problem. So sometimes staff canteens where the food that is prepared there is under some control and management. It can be very useful so that then people can at least get some balanced meal. The, the hot meal that their mental health 
specialist was talking about. And then also rest for the staff, which will create roosters that allows I mean, staff to have some rest. And then even good chairs. Sometimes the chairs that is used in the office space is terrible and contribute a lot to back problems of staff. And sometimes it is, it's not much. I mean, but you find out that, I mean, some lousy chairs are given and they sit on it for hours and they get us, I mean, uh, back problems. And then we should try and encourage physical activity of staff. Organizing health walks once in a while, office gym, if it's possible. And then yeah. health screening, health screening for staff. One of the things that I've seen, one of the regions is doing it. I think even two regions, it's very nice. They've linked it to the BFD so that they, once your BFD comes, the human resource contacts you and say that today is your BFD, blah, blah. Then you go for a health screening. I mean, they screen for all sort of as a like a birthday present. But then it's all part of ensuring that you are in optimal condition. And if anything is wrong, then it's picked up early. So, I mean, when it comes to the physical health part, these are things that we can do to support ourselves and support the staff. Then when it comes to the curative services, what are some of the ways in which we can contribute to help the staff in terms of the health worker? For conditions that are covered under the National Health Insurance, one of the things that we are pushing for that we think we can do, because we control these things, because sometimes the worry is that people working in the peripheries Let's see, uh, I work with the Ghana Health Service. I mean, if you have somebody working in the district, for example, when he comes to the regional hospital, it's like nobody knows him or her. He joins the queue like everybody else. And this is a Ghana Health Service facility. But the person is treated like a stranger. If money is being collected at records, they collect money from him or her. When you go to the lab and money is being collected, you collect it from a man and he's in the queue. We think this is not acceptable and we need to take care of ourselves. That, I mean, so within district and regions, hospitals should facilitate care for all health staff working in the district or region for conditions that are covered under the health insurance. I'm not saying it is free. The key thing is that the person is uniquely identified as a Ghana Health Service staff the person has a valid health insurance card. All that the facility needs to do is expedite care so that at least there's a place where the person can be seen fast. So what we call the concept of a staff clinic. Even organizations that are not health related, sometimes do it. So it is something that is a low hanging fruit that we can do to help our staff assess health care in a way that is not, so that all the conditions that at least are covered, facilities, district hospitals, regional hospitals, should be able to create these rooms where there's a dedicated doctor, create a pharmacy place, a lab, so that, I mean, it is just expedited service. It's not like it's free service. It's expedited service covered by under the National Health Insurance. The problem comes when we have condition that is not covered under the health insurance. It is a policy of the Ministry of Health to support employees to assess healthcare, which is not covered. And this has been spelled out in the existing condition of service that is signed between the ministry and its agencies. But in any case, this covers only 50% of the cost. And they are registered spouse and four children as negotiated under the joint agreement. So where it's established that an employee contracted an occupational related disease or ailment before retirement, the, the agreement says that the service shall be responsible for the treatment. And then related to the above is a compensation. If you are injured and there's a workman compensation that can be worked out and paid. And then employees are to be provided foreign medical services for health conditions or ailment that cannot be treated locally. And then employees are equally entitled to medical refund. So this is what is in the agreement for conditions that are not covered under the health insurance. 
but it is on record that the Ministry of Health has in recent time been unable to provide support for employees who have made virile requests for funding support for medical treatment internally and abroad. I mean, and those who require some prescribed medication to survive. And even where the government has been able to provide the support, mm -hmm. the approval <laughs> process is so long that it leads to delay. And let me give you an idea of the approval process. If I'm in the health facility in the district and I have such a problem, the letter goes to my medical superintendent or my district director, who then puts the recover letter on it to the regional director. Then the regional director also sends it under cover to director general of the service. If it's a teaching hospital, the same route through the CEO, then it goes to the Ministry of Health. Then the Ministry of Health will put a covering letter to it to the Jubilee House. And if there's money, if you are lucky at that time, then you get money released. So, I mean, most often it, really, it leads to lots of, and this is an example. I mean, I've compiled some of the things. I mean, most of the time at the, at the Ghana Health Service, I, I sort of am the schedule officer on, on this. So I sort of move move these letters. So these are some of the conditions. I didn't know it's no more direction that requires surgery. And this is the hospital where the person was working at paid 4,000 and 7,000 was left. It was still outstanding. And then malfunctioning kidney. Dialysis at private health facility. I've already had seven dialysis. And this is it. The person died before help could come. 29,000 was needed. 3,500 3, 3, PCI on stand. It's still outstanding. Yes. So this is how it looks like. It is not a pleasant picture. It's not a pleasant picture at all. And it's something that we seriously need to look at it in a pragmatic way. And this is my picture of it. If you have a house burning, the, the, the thing that we have is that we have people who have been hired or employed to put out fire, that the fire service. So if your house is burning, will you wait for the house to burn because you call fire service? I mean, you always make an attempt to stop the fire. And even when you call the fire service, I mean, it may take a while. So you make an attempt to stop the fire. Good. If you're on the road, you have your right of way. You have your right of way, like you are going to Kumasi, you're on the right of way. A car, a big truck is coming from Kumasi towards Accra, and it just move into your lane. The pragmatic thing you do is that you get off the road silently and let it pass, and then you will continue your journey. If you insist on your right of way, you won't reach Accra. And that's where we are as employees now, that if we insist on our right of way, then we will end up with what we are seeing. All these people who most of them will end up dying. So we need a pragmatic approach. And I think the practical response is that we need to take our destiny into our own hands. We need to have an employee managed health fund. For it to work well, all employees should be on board. And it's not only doctors. We need to get all the employees within the health sector to buy into it. Because it's about numbers. The more numbers we have, the more sustainable it can be. And the, we need to reach out to the other unions, health service workers union, nurses, I mean, so GM, the unions need to yeah. work together on this. Because as I said, the situation as it is now, we need to have a very practical response to what is happening to our, our members. So the practice Matic's proposition is a top-up medical health fund for all health workers. And what we're proposing is that it's supposed to provide additional coverage for employees, I mean, who may suffer from huge medical expenses that NHI may, may not be able to support. And it will be complementary in the sense that if anything arises, then it's good. So the objective is to protect and support the health and well-being of the employees and retirees or the service by relieving them from catastrophic medical expenses that fall outside the NHI. And the purpose is to ensure better health benefit for employees and increase their satisfaction and productivity. So the guiding principle that we're looking at is equality of treatment and equal access to health service, solidarity 
in financing through the rich pooling, sec security and fraud control, cost containment effort as much as possible, and simplicity, simple and less bureaucratic to administer. It should be something like that, that the governance of it. So we've done some work on it initially, and that's how it looks like. I mean, even if you have 85,000 staff enrolled, averagely 10 Ghana cities, this is how per annum you can generate. And if invested over a long period, I mean, this event that we talk about are rare events in a huge population. If you, had, if you have huge membership, it's, these are rare events. So the, the ability of the fund, actually, there's, the actuarial studies who did it saw that it was quite a sustainable thing. So we look at the framework, the design of the scheme, the sources and mode of funding, benefit package, governance systems that need to be put in place. And it should be looked at as a revolving fund dedicated for financing medical bills or staff for conditions that are not covered by the health insurance. The employees make monthly contribution to the fund for their salary deductible as source. Yes, the fund to, will be managed by an independent fund manager appointed by the steering committee of the unions. So the unions make up the steering committee. They appoint an independent fund manager. I mean, and then fund management will involve option for appropriately investing some of the fund for returns. I mean, it can be I mean done that way. And then what we also are proposing as managers, I mean, the senior managers of the Ghana Health Service is that we are prepared to reduce the expenditures, administrative expenditures by seconding staff like accountants, administrators to help, I mean, sort of set up the office so that the fund money does not go into payment of salaries to reduce the cost of it. So this the governance structure that we, we we were proposing. I mean, that it is purely managed by the employees. I mean, the steering committee is the highest making decision body, which constitute the various representatives from the various unions and then there's the administrative. And then the secretariat for the day-to-day, -day, that is where we are prepared to provide staff and who are paid, I mean, so, so that they will, they, will, they will not be paid from the fund's uh, money. And then that's what so, uh, we, the, the governing the center we're talking about and then the various committees. And then, yes, yeah, so the proposal was that one to 2% of basic salary can be used. Then once you get that money, then you, we can lobby government for seed money from budgetary allocation on health to add on to, to the seed money. And then, I mean... The benefit package, we're looking at the benefit shall be limited to contributor spouse and four registered children under 21 years. In case the contributor retires, premium is completely wind off. The person does not pay premium again. The retiree spouse and four registered children will be covered if, from the actuarial studies, if the person has been able to do more than five years contribution, then he can be covered when he retires. He, yeah. It will be possible to cover the person when he retires, together with if he had pension babies or whatever, then they are covered. And then also uh, termination clauses to define for start that may leave in the agency. We define all those things yet. And these are the benefit reference we made. I mean, as a proxy for excluding service. So the NHI is, is the proxy. The thing that are provided by the NHI is not part of it. So by Assumption every staff then need to be should need to have a health insurance as a basis because then the thing that are covered by the health insurance will be then dealt with the staff clinic level and then the thing that are outside the health insurance then will be covered by this fund and then we're looking at it that I mean the package should cover total cost of treatment within country and then outside the country yes and from the study that we done it is possible and then. The steering committee can decide on, I mean, those who are managed outside the country. And then the facilities are responsible for the preventive care, health care, the checks up, and then the curative and surgical procedures, all those things are covered. Laboratory and imaging services are covered. So the operational flow, the way we look at it, the disease outside the insurance policy reported, 
then the regional health directive validates the eligibility of the contributor and constitutes a medical board. Medical board reviews the case and issues recommendations to the RAD. The RAD issues approval to the facility to go ahead with the treatment and then facility forwards the bill to the secretariat and the secretariat will pay. So it shortens the whole process. It shortens the whole process. But the condition for success is commitment and support of management members of the service level because of the issue of, as I said, the commitment to support administrative overheads by contributing staff and buying of all unions. Because this one, it is about numbers. GMA alone, it will not be viable. From the actual study that were done, then they need to pay more. But then if you can get the numbers, then the amount of money that is needed to be paid can be small. Yeah. And then once you get the pot of money, you can use it to negotiate for government contribution. And that's what we think. That's, a, I mean, a more pragmatic approach than where the individual falls sick. And then we try to get treatment for the individual which usually does not. Happen. So in conclusion, we say that in this sense, you always plan ahead because you don't know when you'll be hit by catastrophe. Sometimes when we are very young and strong, we do not know what will happen to us. I was an example. I mean, I, keep, I take myself as a very unique example. Five years ago, I had a brain tumor. I mean, it hits, it hits suddenly like that. And I mean, the bill that you were quoting, I didn't have the money for it. To be really honest, I didn't have the money for it. It took friends and family to put the money together for me to get the surgery done. So that that's is how bad it can get. So, I mean, that's what we are proposing. And there's something that we can all do. Once I go we need to really look out for ourselves. If your house is burning, you don't wait for the fire service to come. You start some process before. So that is what we are advocating as a pragmatic way of taking care of our health. Thank you. Over. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. That's the time. Colleagues, as we go, please let's try and come back and move quickly. Okay. At this point, we want to take a break and listen to one of our partners, Sendlab. Sendlab is offering us a discounted uh, check at their stand behind there, and we are giving them an opportunity to give us a presentation, 10 minutes presentation. Please let us welcome them, Sendlab. I'm making your host. I'm making your channel. It's, it's not just the screening that we are offering. I'm making you uh, your host. Uh, we share the fact that as part of our partnership, the chairman is offering us a bigger thing. Members in good time. The list of tests will also be shared. So we, you understand why we have to listen to them. And for today, please, uh, we have to all try and patronize the tests that they are uh, offering us for the screening. It's very important. I, I'm yet to go, but I will go. Um, for the males, you have the PSA, liver function test, kidney function test, and then random uh, blood sugar for 100 CDs per. And all this, all this for 100. The females, you have lipids, liver function test, kidney function test, and then random. No, the ladies don't have PSA. <laughs> At least in this world of gender, gender advocacy, the prostate is one of the things they cannot get. So please let's patronize it and visit their stance. It's important we check our own health as we check others. Thank you very much. Please, let's receive you with a round of applause.
Hi, good morning. Super. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, it's an honor to stand in front of you to, to present. And after the presentation from Dr. Entry and Dr. Fusu, I guess most of us are thinking um, we need to do something about managing our stress levels because the work we do indeed is very stressful. I remember uh, booking an appointment with one doctor that I had to meet. And I was surprised. He had to meet close to 55 patients in just a day. And I'm like, hey, yes, yeah, yeah, Juma, but they've been more, yeah, Juma, pa. So it, it's very important. All right. So SINLAB is a multinational medical laboratory diagnostics um, headquartered in Germany, uh, Munich. Um, about seven, eight years ago, it entered into Ghana through the acquisition of MedLab, MedLab Ghana Limited. So SenLab is the MedLab we all know. Before I go into the details, let's view this video if it can play. If it's not playing, then I probably I can go ahead. This is that make all the difference in your health, can me. I've been doing all my tests at MedLab for over 20 years till they rebranded to SEMLAB. You know, he was just a little boy when I started bringing him to MedLab. Oh. Sorry, send up. is the new man. No need to wait long periods in line or suffer through inconclusive tests and wrong diagnosis. My family trusts Sella for accurate tests. Tests and special consultation services in their clinic. With our European affiliation as Europe's number one medical diagnostics provider, SINLAB offers accurate tests than ever before. At SINLAB, our highly trained personnel give our clients personalized attention every step of the way. Convenient centralized location, clean air in the natural environment, guaranteed confidentiality for those seeking professional treatment and care, and above all, affordability. SINLAB is the preferred option for your annual routine health checks to avoid negative health surprises. SINLAB, medical excellence for you. Having the right diagnosis can save your life. Yeah, thank you. Welcome from the commercial group. So basically, we are here to reintroduce ourselves to the medical fraternity. Um, Leaning from the legacy of the old med lab that we all knew, we have gone through different phases. And today, Sin Lab is here supporting um, doctors to be able to offer the needed diagnosis to, to patients. Um, we have been able to receive a lot of accreditations. The notable one is the ISO 15189, which we were able to have it in 2008. And we are proud to say we were the first private medical laboratory to receive this accreditation. 2015, we were able to also uh, migrate that further from South Africa to the German accreditation body, which is one of the most robust um, globally. Um, in 2018, 2020, 2021, and even now, we have been privileged to receive a couple of awards that speak to the kind of good service and quality delivery we bring to our patrons. Please, next. All right. We currently are in 16 locations in the seven regions of Ghana, out of the 16 regions. Um, we hope to be in every region. However, currently, we are in 16 out of the uh, 16, yeah. We are in seven out of the 16. Um, as an organization, we have been growing a bit better. Okay, let's go to the next one. So we can be found in 
Techiman, Pumasi, and all these places, as the previous slide um, said. But who are we? We provide diagnostic uh, services in the area of lab and radiology. A lot of people do not know us to support or provide service in that area where um, we are able to support in, in X-ray. Um, we also have ultrasound in most of our locations as well to support in, in scans of our women and also in all these areas. Uh, I've already talked about the accreditation, so I wouldn't spend so much time on that. But what is instructive to know that apart from we being Europe's number one, our test catalog is the, is the most expansive. We have over 6,500 tests in our test portfolio. And that speaks to our ability to support medical doctors in almost all areas of diagnosis. Um, we do test in hematology through to genetics and molecular. I've already talked about EPO and ultrasound. How do we partner uh, our stakeholders? We have two key ways. If you have a facility, which is a hospital, we can partner you by being able to send your samples to us at an agreed um, pre-arranged rate. Or possibly if you would want us to deepen the relationship, we could come on your premises and set up um, a laboratory on your premises, whereby we may have to either operate it fully or we can co-share and then manage the, the, the lab as well. We also have um, key products that are on the market. Most of them are novel. Some of them are, are routine. Um, for, for instance, we have what we call the newborn screening, whereby we are able to um, screen um, newborns who are born to be able to know exactly what potentially could be um, happening to them. And then we have personalized medicine like my PGX, my Bion, um Nutrigenics. We also do the DNA testing, which is able to help a lot of um, fathers are able to know indeed if their children are theirs. <laughs> we also support in the area of cancer care by doing the BRCA1 and then BRCA2 test to be able to know whether the disease is advanced or not. Why should you choose SINLAB? When you work with us, we can assure you of peace of mind. You would have your peace of mind because you would have reliable and consistent medical results. I've already talked about the fact that we are accredited by the International Standard Organization, so you can be rest assured of the quality of the results you are getting. Um, you also are able to have real-time access to the results. We have three platforms that we use. We are able to send the results to you either on your WhatsApp as a patient or to your email as a doctor so that you can assess it. Or if there is opportunity to give you access to our portal, we give you a password and you can log in, then you can download the results for your patient or even for yourself as a medical practitioner. And then we have one of the most advanced state of the art uh, medical equipment. You know, we operate in over 36 countries and we have global arrangement or agreement with these medical device um, manufacturers. So that gives us the ability to assess cutting edge technology equipment to be able to give results that can be trusted. And then we give timely and accurate results. So this makes us, today we are here to seek that partnership that we would always want to have with medical doctors. We are aggressively um, on the field engaging you in your consulting rooms. It will be good that when we come knocking on your door, you open the door for us to be able to have conversations around supporting you to be able to help in um, better diagnose diseases for patients so that we can have improved health outcomes. We also have very interesting um, packages and arrangements, if I should call it so, for doctors. And that one is on one-on-one -on -one discussion when we come around to your consulting room. So thank you for the opportunity to be here. We would want to engage further so that we can drive medical advancement forward. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll take another quick presentation. The next presenter uh, just took his snack.
and it is now moving into the Umasun and Abomasun. So he has asked me to just give him some time to, so that he can now move to the rumen and diverticulum. So we'll take a quick presentation from AO Holdings, who are also our partners, to talk to us about some hospital management system. Quick 10 minutes, nothing beyond. Let's offer them a clap of it. Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity. It's a privilege to be part of you. My name is Alexander Alotiado. As you do see, I'm, a, I'm part of you, and I have the opportunity to introduce a solution to this country uh, in, in HMS and ERP. Um, but I'll give the next two minutes to my colleague, Kujo, who would just give you a brief overview of what the company is, who we are, and what we do, and then I take over. Thank you. Hello, uh, please. My name is uh, Ojo, and I don't speak a word of Ghanaian, but uh, I've not let that disturb you. Please, um, oh, Holdings is a uh, uh, really organic Ghanaian company. We are based at the Accra Digital Center. And what we've done really uh, over the last two years is to really look at all the troubles that people who use limbs and stuff like that are encouraging. And that's what we really worked on. Um, anybody can walk into the Accra Digital Center. We are also, we have our man post here. We can give you demonstrations and of our system. And we really want to partner with the medical association to ensure that our system, which really takes um, the heavy load of your work, day to day work, becomes uh, uh, a mainstay for your work. So, without drawing up conversation, I'll hand you back over to Dr. Allerton. Thank you. Um, so, as to do explain, um, we come with a solution in hospital management systems and ERP. Unfortunately, it does appear that the room literally is empty. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, I still want us to, to take a look at that Kojo has spoken to already. Please, please move forward. So what, what this hospital management system and ERP does fit what Dr. Yotin spoke about, part of the universal health coverage as we work our way towards that. And how does it fit into it? It fits into it by access. Um, because you can deploy it into your hospital and it gives you operational efficiency from end to end. Indeed, what we have is an extremely customizable um, solution that will transform, replace, and solve all the problems that you currently have in various hospitals from the public sector with the limbs and through the private sector uh, with the various systems that you have. It gives you a handle on your HR, it gives you a handle on your finances, it gives you a handle on your inventory, on your stocks, on your on your procurement, on your um, 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 inventory, on your janitorial and um, your RX covered, you got a glycoposh covered. Indeed, we've got NHI, NHI integrated already into this system. Whatever that you come along with, this is able to speak to, to that for you. We're able to integrate all your medical equipment from MRI, CT scan, PET scan, if you have them, through uh, um, um, ultrasound, laboratory equipments, chemistry, hematology, just name them. All of those, we're able to integrate them together. It's got a patient portal. So today, uh, we've got people who walk into the facility who literally are coming for refill medication, who can join an extremely very long queue. To get. So you've got a patient portal that answers, that provides a solution to that. If we are successful to be able to roll out this one, you're able to determine, for those of us who use insurance and NHIS, to determine which hospital the patient had been to before coming to you, because we recognize that Sometimes when people come, they said, okay, I haven't been anywhere. And yet he's going to collect a refill from somewhere before he walks to you. And somebody will have to pay that. You're able to determine that. When successful, you don't need paper referral. Because when you 
open that, you are able to access and find which hospital the person had been to, what the condition is, why the person was referred from whichever hospital that the person is coming to. In simple terms, we bring you a solution that will revolutionize the healthcare system in this country that provides all solutions and answers to all the questions that we have today. As Kujo indicated to you, we're located in Accra Digital Center and we're extremely reachable, a fully Ghanaian company. We are available 24-7, 365 days in a year. We give you after sales support when you need them and the price is absolutely flat. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Just to assure you that we have close to thousand people online also listening to you. So uh, you, you, it's not that the room is so empty. Thousand people plus those here are listening to you, plus about six thousand people in the spirit. So we'll take one or two questions for you. Uh, Dr. Sian Sari has had to just step out briefly. He's the next presenter to take some important so we'll just take some few questions for him once he comes back he will come and interest me. thank you very much please i would like to know if from your presentation it looks like it's in, you can integrate it with the limbs since most of the public institution is now using the limbs but from what you said if I'm able to access whatever diagnosis the other person was coming from the other facility with, then it presupposes that it's integratable. I don't know, but that is what I'm, uh, I'm thinking. And the second question is, um, okay, when someone subscribes, maybe one day when I become a part of the administration or something or own my own hospital, when you subscribe, is it forever or you have to be paid on yearly basis or something like that thank you thank you uh, thank you very much i want to just take the first question which is really that i think once you use synergy hms you wouldn't really want to you go back to limbs and everything that you refer from limbs we can suck it up here. Now, this does more than what LIMS is giving you. And I don't really want to get territorial. So um, if you come around our, um, our desk, you will see a demonstrable version, which answers probably everything you will ask. Now, in terms of subscription, now most software is now subscription-based. In the olden days, you worry about your storage, you worry about your hosting, everything, internet. We take care of that. So it is really subscription based. You subscribe, very minimal charge um, for a year, and everybody gets to use it. Please, a follow up quickly. I'm, I'm not satisfied with the first answer. Right. The first one, I want to know if I'm using LIMS and I go to another facility, which is it your product? Can they assess my um, details, everything on the other system? That's what I want to find out. Well, or it has to be from one from your product to another hospital which is using your product. Thank you. So, so to answer your question, Limps, if you will, is a competitor of ours, and that's what you currently use. So, what we are now suggesting to you, you've got. Some people sitting out there in India, and I'm suggesting to you that I am seated here with you. I understand your needs. I've been with you all this while. So I know exactly what you're looking for, and you can locate me 24-7, 360 days in a year. So I'm suggesting to you that I am an alternative to what you have currently, because the problem that you have, you can't access them. It doesn't give you all the things that you're looking for. I'm saying that you can use me to replace your limbs. Does that answer your question? All right. Thank so you. I think some of the questions, they are essay type questions. So as Kojo, we are located in the exhibition room, if you will. Right. You could pass by anytime you so desire. 
we will demonstrate to you as it functions and all these ask all the questions that you have and we'll be here throughout with you to the end of the program thank you very much thank you so much let's give them a hand please and feel free to visit their stand and uh, fill in a question and they will address it you can even have a hands-on demonstration please are there any questions for uh, uh send lab send lab are there any questions for send lab any particular contributions for send lab okay thank you very very much and uh thankfully dr Nsia sari has also returned from the important call he had so we will move swiftly to the next presentation and we'll give a, a, a hand of applause to receive dr Nsia sari for the uh, he's a fellow of the association, a surgeon, and he's now a, a proper politician and an advisor to the president. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. The good thing is that if you are the last presenter, the room will be half empty so that you can go very fast. Um, I'm supposed to talk about achieving universal health policy through Agenda 111 projects. And I'm very happy Professor Lawson said the good. He spoke about the resilient health strengthening. And if you look at his speech, he left one of the most important things and he said, I'm here, I'll speak about it. As he rightly said in one, in one of his um, our point presentations. We saw that Ghana, we are running a five-tier system. That's what I call it. We have the base, which is the health center, sorry, chips. And then we have the sub-district, which is the health center, polyclinics. We have the districts where we have the first referral center of every district. And then we have the secondary level, which is the second referral center. And our big boys, the teaching hospitals and the uh, specialist hospital. So if you realize during the COVID, we are completely open up. We realize that we have an, a, a, very, a very big issue in one of our the system that we are running. Basically, the health, uh, the health, uh, the middle level, which is the third level, the district hospital. His Excellency, the president, then charge because we all had those days. And there were a lot of people who were moved from the northern part of the country looking for helicopters to fly them to uh, the UGMC, which was the only isolation center we had in this country. And quickly, we were putting makeshift isolation centers here and there. And then when Ghana Health Service went round, they came back to inform the tax force, which the president was uh, the chairperson, that there are 88 of the 261 districts without any semblance of a hospital. There are some places where they call a hospital. For example, uh, Dr. Tinkren's place, Mankransu. And I told the president that half of the building was even bent, but they were calling it a district hospital. So 88 of these districts, if it is not in the urban area, what it means is that there was not even a doctor in that area. In some areas which are in the urban areas, the private sector was also there. As the doctor said, private sector plus charge is doing about 40% of the healthcare delivery in this country. But there are some areas like Bumkrugu, Yoyo, no doctor at all. Even the district director there is not a doctor. Because I think about 80% of district directors you have in this country are non-physicians, non which is also a problem that we have to solve. So if there's a cholera there, they cannot even diagnose cholera. They don't even understand what cholera is. So quickly, he said, what do you do? And then we said that um, we have to look at where we can get people to go and serve in this area. But the only way we can do it is that we have to have a functional hospital in these areas. 
That's the reason why, if you remember, when he announced it in April 2020, he was talking about Agenda 88. But later on, we then told him that, Mr. President, we cannot talk about Agenda 88, but because there are some of the new regions which also don't have the secondary referral center, that's the fourth tier. So the six new regions, we added the six new regions. And, and then he then said that he also promised during the campaign period that he will give Takrade a befitting regional hospital. So we added Takrade regional hospital. And then we said, okay, we will then refurbish the Fia Panta hospital. So the Fia Panta becomes a metropolitan specialized hospital in the Takrade secondary metropolis. And then quickly, I'm sure the mental health, mental health service people will then understand us. We were at a meeting when the Minister for Finance, whose wife is also a mental health practitioner, then said that we are talking about hospitals and we've forgotten about mental health services. So what was dear to his heart was to redevelop the old 1914 Accra Psychiatric Hospital into a state-of-the-art 22-bed specialized psychiatric hospital. So we agreed to add it. And then I also added that almost everybody from the North Middle Belt, if you need any specialized training or anything psychiatric, you have to come to Ankafu or Pantano or Psychiatric Hospital. So we should have psychiatric hospitals in the other zones. So we added the Middle Belt zone and then also the Northern zone. So as you speak now, we started a new psychiatric hospital, 99, 90-bed psychiatric hospital in Tamale, which I will show some pictures, and also another one for the middle beds in Oni, and uh, Ejoso uh, uh, municipality. So in all, if you add all these things together, then it came to 101 district hospitals, and then... Um, 101 district hospitals. I have a slide. Okay. So the agenda one one consists of 101 district hospitals, seven regional hospitals because of it, second D, etap and then two regional psychiatric hospitals and one national psychiatric hospital, which is a class psychiatric hospital. The what is in the hospitals? Well, it's not working. Okay. The hospitals are well equipped, modern, fit for purpose facilities. Okay. And they will operate automated data management system. They will be training for they will be used for training for doctors, practitioners, dentists, optometrists, and then medical students and specialist training, among others. And our medical students will also benefit from this, and there will be we will also have tele medical innovations for in the each of these hospitals. The hospitals, the project is zoned into eight zones. So we have zone one, which covers central western north, uh, north uh, western north Ahafo and Bono. There are twelve of projects in the uh, zone one. That is one regional hospital at a half of. and then 11, 10, uh, 11 district hospitals. So there are 12. Zone two also covers part of cent one central region, eastern region, and the western region. And they have 11 district hospitals, and then one regional hospital in uh, Takrade, which, which has also started, is ongoing now. So there are 12 of them. Zone three has 14 district hospitals. The regional psychiatric hospital, so there are 15. They are both li mostly in Greater Accra and Eastern Region. And then Zone 4 is in Greater Accra and Uti, 12 district hospitals, and one regional hospital in Dambai. And Zone 5 is Upper West, Northern Region, and Savannah. There are 13 of them. That's one regional hospital in Savannah. And Zone 6 have also 15 with one regional hospital in Northeast. And Zone 7, we have 11 of them. 11 district hospital, and then one regional hospital, and then uh, there are 13 of them. And then if you go to 
Ashanti region is the only zone, which is zone eight, which is in only one region. With 15 district hospitals, one regional hospital in the Ahafo. And then there's the psychiatric hospital in Oni. So there are 17 projects going on. And uh, if you go into the zones, sorry, that is it. So, why is it not working? So, if you go to zone one, these are the towns where the hospitals are. There's one in Diaz, Adabokrum, Bodi, Dadiaso, Kukum, Kenyasi. Jabodom, Udumasi, Jinjini, Doma, Amasu, Inahini, and Sefiri also. They are the district hospitals in Zone 1. And then if you go to Zone 2, we have Gomua France, Asin, Breku, Awutu, Insuaib, Chichiwere, Heman, Insaba, Agona, Ahanta, Mpoho, Ofuasi, Airebi, Achim Swetro, Achim Mansu. If you go to Zone 3, Hospitals are in Abobusu, Pabe, Atipogu, Krabwakota, Tiasi, Adesu, Abubulushi, Takuma, Tansuma, Akra, Metro, Adenta, Kokumribri, Nima, Usu, and Madina. But in the zone, the ones in the Akra, we've realized that there are about four of them that we don't have size as we speak. For example, Takuma has no, no, no place. So we are also taking a decision to relocate it to other places where they will need it. If you go to zone four, they are in Ashaman, Nungua, Prampraba, Potema, Sege, Dolo, Sotio, English, Yaman, from Kajedi, Jaseka, Chindere, and Pasa. In zone five, in zone five, they are in Isa, Tafiyama, Fusi, Lambusi, Golu, um, Wichao, Wolisi, Sanregu, Saboba, Savlugu, Manton, Taboya, Pabi, and Damango. Damango is a regional hospital. Zone 6 is in Suwarungu, Timpani, Umbungu, Garu, Fumbisi, Nangodi, Pandai, San, Chilipone, Yoyo, Paga, Pusiga, and Bumkrugu, Ya. Yabaga and then uh, Bundiri and then Narego is the regional hospital. Zone 7 is Businya, Kadiji, Pran, Adakuluwaya, Vigo, Lokwati, Pentoi, Avitapa, Yolokuta, Anuraga, Peva, Peve, Akachi, and then the Kamali Sagate Hospital, and then Techima Regional Hospital. Zone 8 is in Adansia Sukwa, Boa Mine, Mankranso, Kunsu Mankranso, um, Adubia, Mansu Adubia, Asokore Mampo, Barakese, Esiwa, Papanapao, in Oboase, Misuta, Kodie, Edujama, Kokope, Akrofru, Trede, Bantemaso, Metro, Atanpao, Kumase, and then in Kumase, and then Gos. The other one is the this is the psychiatric hospital in Accra. Two of the regional hospitals are Ministry of Health projects. That's the one at Takra, which has started, and the other one at Tampai, which will start very soon, and the redevelopment of psychiatric hospital. As we speak, 87 of the sites are actively working with contracted sites. We haven't left the project just like that. We have been monitoring the project since May this year. So if you have looked at the series on the TV, anywhere we go, we have had two conference calls to make sure that people know what is happening and the villagers will all be there, the chiefs and people will be there. So this is one of the first sites we, we went to trade in. Um, out of the 101 districts hospitals that we have started, quickly I will add that the district hospitals are, are mainly being done, the 101 by the uh, Ghana government, funding. It has a very dedicated source of funding from lifting of oil. So the anytime we lift oil, money comes into the system and they will pay. We have a special purpose vehicle where the money uh, passes through and then they control the 
for drivers. It's at a gift. We call it health gift, which has been formed, which we are all on health gift. And so I'm the chairman of the health gift. And we make sure that the monies come in quickly and then we pay the contractors. This is a project that uh, this is the psychiatric hospitals is a project which is well funded, and the contractors will tell you that they are paid every time they bring uh, their interim payment certificates. Some of them have collected six interim payment certificates. So the projects are going on very successfully. The 14 of the sites, the remaining sites, we have issues of sites. As I said, about four of the sites in Accra, we don't have any land at all, as you speak. There are some of the sites that we have we have to do redesign. For example, the Accra lands where they are very small lands. We need about 15 acre land. If you look at the structure of the hospital, it's one story, spread on a 14 acre land with free air and everything so that we can have a very good hospital with a compound in, in, inside the hospital for patients to be moving around. And it is built for a purpose because we conceived this idea during the COVID period. So if you make sure that social distancing was taken care of, there are two pavilions where the patients will come and sit before they move to the consulting rooms, before they move to the wards. There is a kitchen where we also created a, a place for the staff to have a, a dining room there with accommodation attached to it, which I will speak, I will speak about the accommodation because most of the hospitals are in the rural areas. And for example, you, you, if you don't put a medical unit there, it will take somebody like a pastor, like a professor, to pay to go and stay there. Because you have to be touched. So we want to create a system there. Where, to me, that is where the rural incentives come. So that the government pays for the accommodation. They will move in. You have a crash there. You have a... Hello? Commercial area where we can have a saloon. One tea. 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 One knocking at our door that they want to do this. And this is what we want to do in all the, especially the rural districts. So, this is, okay. So this is how the hospital looks. I will quickly go through the zoom and you will see some of the pictures of what we have reached. So this is in zone one. This is what you have seen in Bodhi, Swaman, these are the ongoing works which is going on. Most of the hospitals have been moved. Some of them are doing internal uh, plastering and then terrazzoing. And we are hopeful that by the first end of the first quarter of the year, we will then start, uh, we will come out to the first 53 of the hospitals and commission it because we are now in the process of doing the equipment processes and procurement. And then the other ones which you have started, that is about 30 or 40 of them, will be also be commissioned by the third quarter of next year. And the, the ones that we have recently started, a year by this time, we hope to commission at least about 90 of them and put them to use. So I'll quickly go through some of the pictures for you to see what is going on. But this is not working. So this is some of the Projects in zone one. And we've gone to all the zone one. The ones which are left, we have to go is zone five and zone six in the northern side. And this is what we saw the work which is going on in some of the zones. This one is zone two. It's gone very far. Those who have been there will see what we're talking about. This is uh, one of the projects, for example, in zone three that we have seen. This is in zone four. We've been to all the sites. Some of the sites started late because of land issues and the rest. And then this is what is in zone five. We've gone to all the zones, all the uh, areas in zone five. This is what is happening in the upper part of the country, in Lambusi. 
Uh, I'm sure uh, that the Titus is here, he has seen it. And that is what we are going to use at this point. <laughs> and then uh, this is in Pinduri and Muntrubu, zone six. This is also part of the place in zone six. And in zone seven, this is what is happening there. In Sene, East, and Nagotem, and the rest. This is in, in zone eight. This is what is happening where the president had a sword in Sene. It's almost completed. It will be the first to be co completed at the mission. And this is what is in Bosnia, Froho, and Bijama. And this is, these features are from the end of August. So from August to now, most of them have gone past what we have seen. So I'll quickly talk about the impact. What's the impact of Agenda Wawawa? As the Prof. Yossin said, we have to achieve investor health coverage and I will qualify my quality investor health coverage. So we are going to bring uh, health closer to the people. And the hospital will also serve as a primary referral center and it's a state of the art more um, fit for purpose modern hospitals. We have these facilities in the hospital. There are x rays, laboratories, ultrasounds, maternity ward has uh, two theaters inside the maternity ward. We have other two, uh, two theaters also for general, general uh, surgery and the other surgeries. We have emergency center. We have female ward, male ward, children's ward, two dental chairs in each of the hospitals so that we can be centralized and then send our dentists outside a crime to Massey. There's an I unit, there's a UN ENT unit, and most important, we have a public unit where we will do wellness clinics. And then the uh, accreditor clinic will be done in the public health unit. There, there's a 24 mortuary facility, there's a kitchen for patients and staff, and there are few staff accommodation for the senior staff. As I said, for the other staff, we are going to put up the uh, staff accommodation. What the next thing is that. There will be a lot of job creation for both health professionals and non-health professionals and other businesses in the town and the district will also open. For example, every district hospital will have a hospital about 549 staff, all staff. And then there are 101 hospitals, so that alone will create over 55,000 work, work for the health staff. The regional hospitals will create 1,343 jobs. So in total, to create about 9,000 staff work and the psychiatric hospitals will also will create 2,841 jobs. So we are expecting to put from next year about 67,635 staff in the on our payroll. We have sent all these things to the Ministry of uh, uh, Finance for them to also cater for it in from the first, second quarter, third quarter, and the fourth quarter. For doctors alone, the district hospitals will have 23 doctors per, per, per hospital. And that is the maximum that we, we expect. That's the maximum that we expect. So, this, so it will create for the district hospitals. I'm sure I'm starting to say that it's, it's a very new time for us. But this is what will be the full staffing norm for the district hospital. The full staffing norm for the regional hospitals will be 182 doctors. And for the psychiatric hospitals, 21 doctors. So this is what we have proposed to the Ministry of Finance. And we work towards it. So what it means, to let people stay, it means that we have, we have a lot of full factors. That's what I said that this is where we have to create a rural incentives in the form one which we will support, and we are pushing for it. Accommodation for anybody who goes in these areas will be taken care of by the Ministry of Finance. And then the rest will be added up through the, uh, the GMA and the government. And then the most important thing is that these hospitals will also be used for training. So it will assist us to decentralize one, residency training, and two, also clinical training, for all our medicals, both private and public, and then for training for medic uh, other health professionals, and then also we also will start a project where we will, uh, do telemedicine for support 
of those who are there. And then we are going to do this. If you have these hospitals, eventually there will be investment attraction to these districts and then encourage entrepreneurial activities in the districts. And then open up the district for professionals, both hotels, restaurants, and hospitality, and commerce. So at the number one project is found in all the 16 regions. The regions with that with the list will be two district hospitals and one regional. In every region, there is again there are the one one projects there. In Volta region, there are seven projects. In the Putin region, there are five projects. In North Northeast, there are five projects, six projects there. So everywhere in the country, we have a Kenta one one. And we are hoping that, as I said, the first 50 will be by second quarter, and the rest that we have started will be on the third quarter. And by this, we are hopeful that quality health care will be accessible and then true health insurance can also be affordable for the good people of this country. And that is what is going to help us to strengthen the health systems that we have in this country. So that is what we are doing at the one one And the hospital, it looks exactly like this. The other batch will be a two-story building where the land space is very small. But this the shape of like, the one one all looks like what is here on the land. And then, thank you very much. Oh, please. Please let the clap be louder. As it gets louder, they will get more financial clearance. So let it be louder. In fact, uh, when he was talking, my president was smiling at me because some of our problems will be solved. All the financial clearance will be solved. Uh, Dr. Dr. Nsiansari, if we come and the clearance is becoming a year, it will become one, one, one. <laughs> so as we have been sitting for long, uh, we need to help the circulation and redirect the circulation. So we'll do some some, there's a clap that I learned in the north. I hear it redistribute blood circulation so fast that if some will go to your brain, in fact, you can even increase the 25% that they say goes to your brain. So it's, they call it a tamar clap. So I'll demonstrate and we'll all follow so that we we'll shake ourselves up a bit. We've been talking about healthcare, sedentary life, and uh, we have been sitting for long. So we'll all stand and do it. Uh, co helps to help me. So it goes like this. When we go, Atama, 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 Atama. Please, go on and say what you show why. Atama, Atama, Atama. Good. So these people. These people don't follow instructions. Yes, So Atama is one. Simple. Then we go to Lamako. Lamako. La Marco. La Marco. Very good. Aha, uh -huh, those are the people. <laughs> and then the last one is Aberina. Hey. Aberina. Good. So now, when I say slow, you go slow. When I go fast, you go Nanyan. So, Atama, Atama, Tamako, Tamako, Aberina. Ah, so, we, we, we increase the speed. Atama, 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 Tamako, Tamako, Aberina. Some people are doing fast points. They cannot find their own hands. So the last one, that's the fastest. Atama, 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 Lamako, Lamako, Aberina, 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 Aberina. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It, uh, it was interesting seeing the neurosurgeon missing some of the people. <laughs> this means their hands and coordination. <laughs> So I'll hand over to my co-MC. Yes, thank you very much, Richard, um, for the icebreaker. Please, we are going to have a final presentation from one of our partners, um, Fuji Films. Please, are you here? We are giving you 10 minutes, please. Thank you very much.
Please let's welcome them with a clap. All right. Sorry about the technical glitch. Uh, my name is Innocent. I represent uh, Fujifilm uh, Corporation. I manage the business for West and Central Africa. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be before you. Today, we are here to present the Fujifilm product portfolio and our healthcare solutions. That will also be a part of uh, um, the tools you need in your clinics and in your hospitals to be able to, you know, provide optimum services to your patients. All right. Thank you. So I will just um, go straight to the point. Fujifilm is a Japanese company. Uh, most of us know Fujifilm from the photograph. As far back as in the 30s, Fujifilm was already doing very well in the area of photography. And uh, uh, in 1936, they developed the first X-ray film, and that was their first venture into um, healthcare. Uh, the technology was easier for them to, you know, um, or say the innovation was easier for them because since they were already doing the normal photography, which used to do films and then darkroom development and the rest of stuff, so it was easier for them to just expand the size of the film still using the same system of developing photography. And that was our first time for into radiology. And that's how X-ray film was born. And today, oh, today, if you can see the trajectory from, you know, from 1934 all the way to 2021, that has been our you know, continuous growth and innovation uh, across the healthcare field. Uh, in 1983, we innovated an advancement in radiology. And that was when digitizer was introduced into the uh, industry. This is to make X-rays to be digital instead of analog. And what you see there on the ground is actually uh, the first digitizer that was ever developed. It was as big as the kitchen cabinet, but I can tell you today that that same system that is as big as that has been miniaturized to that small one that the arrow points at a tabletop digitizer doing both x-ray and mammography investigations. So uh, fast forward to 2021, Fujifilm also acquired Hitachi. Uh, most of you know Hitachi uh, in area of CT, MRI, ultrasound, because of the uh, Hitachi local partnerships and the rest of them. Today, Hitachi business is now a Fujifilm business, and this has expanded our scope in the industry and made Fujifilm today the biggest healthcare company in Japan. Okay, so because we acquired Hitachi, now we have an expanded scope, and this is the area that we cover. I'll be sure more about that. Uh, this is really... So Fujifilm plays in several er areas in healthcare. We are into you know, preventive medicine. Uh, for most of us that are very active online, you hear where Fujifilm is presenting the Neura technology. So the Neura solution is about trying to enhance the aspects of you know, preventive care, screening services for colorectal cancer and general body checks. This is one of the things that we're promoting. It's already available in Japan. It's already available in India. And we're trying to bring it to Africa. At this point, we don't have anything. We don't have it presently in Africa, but we are, you know, growing the interest so that people understand that prevention is always better than cure. And if we are able to detect no cases early, we are able to take care of them, even if it is cancer. So this is an awareness and a call to action for us, but we have not gotten there. So we are also into diagnosis. 
which is actually where all our technologies, X-ray, CT, MR, and the rest of them are, are factored into. And then we are into treatment because we have endoscopy as well for those who are into uh, endoscopic services. Then we have also advanced the home care solutions because we know that healthcare today is going towards home. Uh, we have a very portable X-ray solution, a very portable ultrasound solution that we can actually transport to any location, just like as the size of a particular part that you can put on a bike or put it in your car, go to any remote location and do X-ray investigations that can even be interpreted immediately using AI. We have deployed this in already in several countries across the world through Global Fund Partnership through Screen TV in so many countries. We launched it in Ghana um, last, I think, uh, that was in September, and it's still available for us. If you're available to respond to us, uh, I will introduce my Ghana partner at the end of the day, so you know who to meet. So today, because of our advancement, we look at the entire portfolio. This is the area that we have in place at the moment. So we are very strong in endoscopy, full radiology from X-ray film to uh, X-ray printers to X-ray, to MAMO, to CT, to MR, everything that you have to do in radiology, we can provide. In addition to endoscopy, we have ultrasound as well, and we have a very robust healthcare IT. Today, everything is going digital, and you can be leading that innovation. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so because of our expansion and acquisitions and the rest of them, we are now playing in the same space where you see GE, Siemens, Philips, we are now one of the strongest, but number four, actually uh, aspiring to, to be number one in the OEM business. So these are areas where we are leading in so many aspects in, in the world. Number, we are number one in the uh, computer radiography systems and flat panel detector technology globally. We are number two in endoscopy globally. In picture archival and communication system, which is one of the things that is really needed in this our environment, because data is very important and being able to keep medical records is also very important. So PAX is our solution and we are leading in that space. We have point of care ultrasound. We are also leading in that space. And uh, in uh, <clears throat> yeah, and in mammography also, our solution is standing out as one of the best uh, mammography solutions globally because of our advanced applications. Still talking about our one-stop solution, so I'll be I'll be faster. So the machine I introduced before is the portable solution that you can take to any community and do X-rays and have AI interpretations instantly. That's what you see at the top right. Uh, this solution is being deployed globally and is a very unique solution in trying to detect missing TV cases because you can take this if it is fully charged. As you, what you see there, as it's looking like a camera, is actually an X-ray machine. And if it is fully charged in any location, you can do up to 100 X-ray investigations without a battery dying. And you can have your instant report. This, I'm not saying that you don't need a radiologist, but for TB detection, the algorithm is perfect. It's been tested globally and it's been deployed globally. So with this, it will reduce your cycle of TB screening to be able to detect more. You're talking about our first-stop solution. So talking about CT scan, we have the range of CT scan all the way from 16 slice CT to 128 slice CT, full cardiac options and no cardiac options. As far back as 1975, we were actually the first company via Hitachi to produce the first CT scanner in Japan. And that technology has continued, continued up until now, where we have all the modern and advanced CT solutions. And to add to it also, in terms of cardiac imaging, most cities are coming as standard CT scan with just open gantry. But Fujifilm has a new technology 
which is able to move the CT table from left to right. Where this is very important is in cardiology. If you want to do cardiac imaging, we all know that the heart is not at the center of the body. So for you to be able to send that the heart at the center of the CT gantry, to be able to have very high image quality and resolution for cardiac imaging, Fujifilm is the only solution that is able to position the patient to the center because our table can move left or right, 15 degrees to each side. And this is what our one page slice CT can do if you're focusing in cardiac investment. For our CT uh, 16 slice, 32 slice, we still have a very advanced technology and we have what we call Synapse 3D, which is an advanced uh, workstation, most advanced workstation that we have. Because most hospitals, even though they have bought other equipments, not Fujifilm CTs or MR, they buy our advanced workstation because they have a lot of application for diagnosis and being able to report you know, uh, radiologic uh, images more appropriate. We have places that are using our Synapse 3D in Nigeria, but the equipment they are using are either GE or Canon or, or, or Toshiba. Currently, we have about 16,000 CT scans uh, globally, and a lot of some of all those uh, technologies I talked about, I'll have to skip them. I'll have to skip them. Same thing for MR. So we have MR solution from 0 0.3 Tesla to 1.5 Tesla and more. And the uniqueness of what we have is that till date, Fujifilm is still the only company that can give you a 0 0.3, 0 0.4 Tesla MRI brand new. And this is very, very unique to our environment because we know that power is a constant for us. Most of us are not able to either even afford to purchase a 1.5 Tesla or not able to maintain it because of the issue of power and the issue of helium. Now, if you have a 1.5 Tesla system, it means that the machine can never go up. If it goes up, you either lack helium, and when you lack helium, to replace helium is as expensive as buying either an X-ray machine or a CT scan. So we still have that opportunity to give you a permanent magnet that is able to do up to 80% of what a 1.5 Tesla can do, apart from very advanced uh, operations. Our low field MR, which is 0.4 Tesla, 0.3 Tesla, can do MAMO, it can do uh, MRA and the rest of them. Maybe you might not be able to do the advanced one like spectroscopy and the rest of them. But the question is, how many times do you actually do all those uh, investigations? Our market is basic diagnosis is what we need. This is where the low field MR comes in. And with our advanced uh, packages or let's say advanced applications, you are able to address the issue of time because a lot of people are concerned about time you spend in the MRI room. Now, what you do in MR, if you are using uh, two minutes to do a brain MRI in 1.5 Tesla, then I use it a minute and 10 seconds to do the same in our advanced 0.4 Tesla. This is one of the technologies that we are promoting uh, locally, and we already have started seeing customers in Nigeria. Now we'll be installing about two or three in the next uh, six months in Nigeria, because this is our focus piece for our environment. How about about 8,000? 400 uh, <coughs> MRIs installed globally right now. So this is our product portfolio for MR. We also have three Tesla, but at the moment we are not promoting it locally. So we have ultrasound cutting across all segments, radiology, uh, women's healthcare, cardiovascular as well, even in surgery. And like I said, we have point of care ultrasound, which helps in anesthesiology and emergency medicine. What is unique about our solution is that all our systems are almost the same system, but the configurations we can we can make it. So, like I said, we have mobile applications that have AI embedded in them, and we have very strong IT infrastructure. And we are doing a lot locally to be able to support our partners. So we have training in time. I we have a partner, Dan, who is present. So this kind of stuff. So if you need any of us, feel free to reach out to us. We are still here. We will be here till tomorrow, till next tomorrow. If you have any need, we are happy to support you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Innocent. All right. So at this point, we are going to have a plenary session. And to lead us, we are going to have all our presenters, um, those who gave the lecture. We will have Dr. Anthony. In Siastari, please to come to the high table.
Then we have Dr. Anthony Adolfo Bosu, he is online. And uh, Dr. Peggy Ekremet, please, if you are here, kindly join us in the discussion. Then we have Prof. Alfred Edwin Yosin. Yes, please. Please, let's welcome them with an Atama Club. Okay. To moderate the panel session, we have the medical director of Efian Fanta Regional Hospital, Dr. Joseph Tambil, to lead us in the panel discussion. Please let us welcome him. Please, let's welcome him. He's the host. He can decide to give us food or not. Thank you, Dr. Good afternoon, colleagues. Um, the time is far spent. Um, we have a very important activity in the afternoon. So we would want to be snappy with uh, the proceedings from here. Uh, bad one. So we'd want to be very snappy so that we can finish quickly and then uh, go on to other issues. Uh, but as moderator, I have some bet, um, privileges. Uh, that's a privilege to have the first bite and the cherry. So I'd want to pose the first uh, few uh, questions and then the floor will be open for the rest of, of, of the people. So um, to start with, uh, for Prof. Yosin, um, I think you underscored the uh, role of uh, strong leadership in us achieving uh, resilience even in the face of COVID. Um, and I would want to add that this strong leadership is actually mainly physician leadership. Because if you look at the number of people who go and so looking at this, what do you think we can Very high. A lot of 
I sincerely believe the easiest way will be when we write a doctor, we put MDD in bracket after our name, Dr. Ernest Young, MDD, that's medicine, to differentiate us from other cadres of staff. But that is just by the way. We need to educate strong leadership skills so that wherever we find ourselves, we make a difference and that will speak for us rather than words. And also take some strategic policy decisions. I was very happy when during the last uh, interview, call for interviews for directors for district health management in the district director for health services, I saw that GMA was actively trying to recruit people for these positions. That is one area we should look at seriously and DMA should continue in that good step. Otherwise, now those positions are being occupied mainly by midwives. It is now potentially going to be occupied by physician assistants. And imagining your boss in the district is a physician assistant. If we don't take strategic measures, that is coming. And that is if uh, midwives are occupying those positions and now we have physician assistants all over the district and doctors are not going for those positions because we prefer to remain in the hospital and be med suits. So even those we train at the Ghana College of Physicians are family physicians, public health specialists, when they go back to the district, they still want to be med suits instead of directors of a uh, district uh, because maybe there are some incentives that may not be we look at the general good of the fraternity and sometimes put ourselves up for this position so that at least once we leave the district we can take some strategic decisions that will benefit the district as we're saying even when there is an outbreak of cholera you need a technical person who can lead this child know what has to be done, what diagnosis to take. We are not downplaying the intellect of any group, but it is a truism that the doctors are the leaders of the health team and we must now to be counted. So this will be my initial comment. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I'll add something to what Prof said before. Um, I think I'm a very typical example of it. A leader in hospital because I've been medical superintendent of the district, medical director in the region hospital, CEO of a teaching hospital, and also director. General. See, the fact is very simple. If you are a medical superintendent and you leave the financial management of the hospital to your accountant and your administrator, you've lost it. And I've always been saying, if you see a contact of the hospital, administrator, and supply officer being a very good friend, there's something wrong with that. And as a medical superintendent, you have to have a way to break them cause some uh, conflict among them. And this is from a practical experience, because I believe strongly that he's talking about how do you maintain these hospitals. If you do a proper budget, you can maintain your hospital. It's the money which can't see that you are supposed to use. If you have a lab and you don't buy reagents for the lab, how do you get money from the lab? Because they will see the patients and divert them to a kiosk opposite the hospital. 
And the person who is sitting in the kiosk is a JHS or SHS, if you are lucky, a brother or uncle of the laboratory technician or we call a laboratory medical scientist in the hospital. So you don't get anything from the lab. Where you get free money from, from for example, Mochi, where you deal with the system. And the Mochi man there is collecting all the money and putting in the pocket. How do you get money from there? When they were making noise when I was in Ghana Air Service, and I said, we will employ more Mochi men. But you put uh, receipts in the mortuary, every money that you collect will be receipted for a week. They say, no, they will do it like that. So there's money in the hospitals, but the money leaks. Or we, the police, if any patient that you see who can pay, you take the money under the table and put it in your pocket. How would the hospital get money? So that's how you don't get money to run hospital. Because you have run hospitals before, and I was able to get more money even with that health insurance. Those days there was no health insurance. Or one health insurance that when I was in Kompana, any that income is extra money. And those of you who are in Kompana, there are a lot of people that who use the hospital idea to trade through a post. And I can say that I trained a lot of specialists, but most of the specialist professors there in Kompana, I can simply handle and say that I trained them. So you can do it. But we are not doing it as professionals. So the blame should come to ourselves as medical competent, as district directors. So that's where the problem is. If you budget very well and then you follow your budget, you will get money to do other things. Yes, finishing the agenda, one, one, one project, as I said during my presentation, we have a dedicated special purpose vehicle where money comes in any time. I'm sure the oil is lifted about four or five times in the year. Anytime it's lifted, 20% of what we call the APF money comes directly to us. And we follow it everywhere. You go to get that money that you need to do. And so far as some of us are concerned, or even the small, the money that we have had so far, there are some of the projects which are about 74, 75 percent. We are moving on. We know where the, the most cost will be, the finishings and also the equipment. But we are doing equipment procurement, which is very, very unique. We'll be doing leasing, we'll be doing the placement, especially the laboratory equipment. We are going to ask people to come and place them in all the laboratories. And we shall run an area laboratory service for the district. So that all the health centers and everywhere, you buy motorbikes, people go around, take the samples and come and run it, and then get their money. We are talking to National Health Insurance so that they can be coupled the laboratory services from the DRH, then you get your money. Because if a private lab can run and take the health insurance and can run the hospital, why not our district hospital? And this is what how we want to do. But I will say that anybody who wants to be a medical superintendent should be trained. You cannot put just a doctor to say that because you're a doctor, go and run in the hospital. Some of them, so most of them, them are not up to the best right. They even fear a candidate, they fear the administrator. And the worst one is the supply officer who is low. He will bring you envelopes, and if you don't ask where the envelope is coming from, he's taking double and bringing you about a point nine. So you are working for him or her. So to me, that is where we are. And I also agree with him. People are taking the doctor and everything. I believe that GMA should make it a distance. Doctors, we call ourselves other. If you're a physician, doctor in brackets, head. If you're a dentist, doctor in brackets, dentist. And let them think the doctor that you want to think. But we have to be very careful. It's a fight that you're doing. Some of us, they attack us because we are doctors. And when you meet them, you don't say it. Oh, what I tell them, the work that you do, you will not, you will not be paid for. Why do you say that you are? You don't get the money for it. So allow the people who are supposed to do it to do it, and then you do your job and collect money, especially the physician assistant. But we have to be very careful. I don't believe that here we should be Just let them take the doctor, and then we call ourselves doctor. Thank you. Okay, so we take the second question. from the floor. I see one, two, one, two, three. So I think we'll take this first. Uh, the rest of it can be ready questions.
the first question is why one time? One time for the I do that all the 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 for obviously, uh, I want to find out. I mean, at the highest policy level, is there an attempt to ensure that the private sector is enabled to play a much bigger role in the health sector than it is now? Because in all discussion, my feeling, I may be wrong, my, my feeling is that it's all the public health sector that is important. And, and that should be helped to grow. For example, the agenda one one uh, facilities. Is, can government think of doctors in group practice, this being leads to them to practice, working over a period of time to pay for it? Because I don't know anybody who is in private practice who over time say that I've been losing. But we know in our health, in our public sector, uh, government brings in a lot and uh, maintenance is a problem. So many things are a problem. So, Prof, if you can help me address that, is there a deliberate attempt to ensure that the private sector is enabled to play a much bigger role than it is? Thank you. I will treat uh, subsequent questions to be kept very short and, and, and concise. So, what the hand up? Right hand. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Maria Nogokoja. And thank you all for the very stimulating presentation. And my question goes to Dr. Isiasa. And this situation with all these other kids out of staff calling themselves doctors and are getting to them and um, duties or authority that is not yet. I'm not sure whether it is as straightforward as we have earlier discussed it today. Look at the situation in the laboratory. Um, Technicians <laughs> and, and the laboratory physicians. And these are people that, I mean, those of us who trained for postgraduate, I mean, a while ago, saw them being trained and their skills being improved by laboratory scientists, no practice back in the day. And then suddenly they have the men, excuse my language, to literally out doctors who are supposed to be laboratory uh, physicians. Now, I'm a family physician. We are supposed to necessarily do rotations with the labs, same for internal medicine or OBGYN, etc. They are supposed to be trained by medical doctors, people who either hold a fellowship or membership in the West African College of Ghana, necessarily. And then you go, and these people literally up in arms, don't allow the doctors to work training them. I think that there should be a meeting. There should be some talking to you. If you employ them, they cannot have their way. This thing started a while ago. I think it's getting out of time. Okay, and look, I think your point is very well made. Thank you very much. Can we go to the next question, please? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, my name is Alberta Amu. Um, my my um, point is just a suggestion to uh, Prof. Wilson. Thank you for bringing the people. I think uh, healthcare leadership is so key. Can we start at the medical schools? And please, can I be a teacher? Everybody gets a 
Not because they want to be patients, because they want to get a position. People, even at the membership, and it's getting sickening, you know, everybody's getting pocket for to be just because then they can get the thing. They get there and they can't even deliver the food. Can I, the faculty and staff they can come also means that how can we leadership? So that we can start training them and start at the mental school by the time they finish quickly. We have even they cannot finish two weeks first. We have a lot of leaders that we are doing there who can train. So how they go to just like the meta have a Sunday trainings we've been having, which has been excellent. Can we look at that? Thanks. Thank you. What Rita, please okay. you want to take this first set? I, I I don't see any other hand up. Okay. Okay, okay, all right, so you, you can come on. Thank you very much. My question is directed to Dr. Shiasai. The essence of Agenda 111 is to improve assets. It's good for the country and I come from life. Where the uh, a hospital that was already there was pulled down with the hope of putting another one. And for some years now, we, did, we have denied the people of Allah access. So when we look, when we look at listen to the media, Mamo people were refused to release a ban. And they were citing last an example. I wish to end my question by appealing that other areas that are not, we don't have lands, maybe think about that, where the facility was pulled down, and then and then and then. And then the plans to have that hospital reopen. So when I go over, when the people meet me and ask me, what are the plans? I will have something to tell them. Thank you. Thank so you. I think we'll, we'll let them yeah, take this thank question. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hello. You see, one thing people should understand every government project has a dedicated family budget. So life has a funding. And the funding was an external funding, what you call uh, EPC plus funding. So once the contract is signed, you cannot go and take another funding from, for example, Eurojet project in Serbia to go and do that. The contract will take you to court. You go to international border, you find one thing. Unfortunately, this contract for that was signed in 2020. There were two funding sources from um, Swiss Bank and Stand Standard Chartered Bank. Swiss Bank uh, filed for bankruptcy, so they were out. And the Standard Chartered Bank that time said, we have to get another source of funding before they can do it. And then we have the IMF. And everything was very slow. But I'm happy to tell you, go and tell your people that. I think the minister made a statement yesterday in Parliament. Luckily, the contractor has found another person, another source to assist Swiss Bank, sorry, Standard Challenge Bank, so that LAP will be started by the same contractor, so that we don't go through the system. The president asked us to add it on the 111. But before you can add to the 111 and then execute the project, the old contract has to be terminated, renegotiated, and then before we can pay for the uh, health issue. And that was what we were discussing until two days and yesterday. I heard that the contractor has found another source. So that will be started before the end of the year. The contractor is already on site. He has played the site. Machines are there and they can do what. Thank you. So second point, second point is that uh, uh, Dr. Um, Rodi was asking why one design. Yes, some of us have problems with why one design, but I'm, I'm happy to tell you that now it's only not one design. Where the land acreage is smaller, we are doing double stack or double uh, story building for them. For example, back to Master for example, uh, Nima Ashama, Idris uh, Yamanfu, and I think uh, the one at Ayawasu West. 
we're going to we are doing all of them. Most of the things in Accra are going to be in storage buildings. So that is how it is. The, the next point is about the laboratories. In fact, the laboratory issue, which is happening in the teaching hospital, I put the blame squarely at the teaching hospital management system. If I have my hospital, I decide who, who works in my lab. Not the person that I've employed will tell me who should be the person who should be working in the lab. Who should come there? Who should not come there? We've met. We've met with them. When we met with them, they were creating issues as if they are the only people who, who do laboratory research. So I told the minister, I gave him a very simple example. Professor Akosta is a laboratory person. What we do is a laboratory person. He will tell the rest of They train these people. So if you are telling them that they cannot work at where, why who they have trained them and they are bringing residents there and they cannot work there, what does it do? So I told Kolebu, Chief Executive, and Bob, not GG, that our Hinaba was there. Tell them if they cannot work there, they should pack and go away. Simple. And who will become the head of the department of a place is a, is a preserve of the management of that hospital. So it's, it's a simple issue. Nobody should come in. The teaching of hospital, it doesn't happen in the regional hospital. We've got the laboratory people, either you are laboratory medical scientists or technicians, and they don't want to call themselves technicians. Or technologists. You do the test, the request comes to you, you do the test, and you give a report. Somebody puts all the reports together and give a diagnosis. Even if that, it doesn't even give diagnosis, it then suggests what the problem is. And the physician who is looking or the surgeon will make his diagnosis. It's a very simple issue. So I think that that issue should not happen. And it should not go on. It's not acceptable. It just the yeah, teaching of the boss should put their feet down. If you cannot work here, pack and go. The, so the rotation of uh, residents or who are doing the uh, laboratory medicine should not be a problem. And who becomes the lead in that lab? It's not for uh, the association to decide who they are doing. It's like they can't even decide who should be a medical lab. And now you are not very well. Let's have a suggestion here come and tell you that we don't want this person to be our medical director. And you tell them why. So these are some of the issues that we don't think is a problem. We will solve it. But we, as the physicians, we need to have a proper uh, leadership group. Thank you. Yeah, the private center also coming. Uh, okay. Nobody bans the private center from coming. But the problem is, these are the that you have to choose now. Are hospitals which are public hospitals, and we believe that we have enough funds in the system, which from the public sector's uh, point of view, we can demand these hospitals in areas where we believe that maybe we charge and it properly. Why not? We can give it a charge, or if a group of physicians join together and they want to come and take, for example, Bumburugu Yoyo Hospital, I'll be very happy and lead them. To take it and employ them, we give them nurses to work and pay them like charge. So you can join together and bring that. I'm a physician, I'm a obstetrician, an oncologist, pediatrician, and a surgeon. We want to go to Bukuru Yo Yo and run the hospital for you. We will bless you and then you take give it to you, but not in Accra. For Accra, you want to do it in our so That's why. We're... Thank you. Where I think, as he said, there should be, and I agree with the, the comment, there should be a deliberate government effort to promote private participation. For example, tasks with the studies and hospital things coming in to be used for the, the care of patients. So, things like this should be looked at at a very high level. So that if it goes to private corporate practice, well, that's something I will yes. add. With the leadership, very, very key. And the, my colleague needs to tell you uh, curriculum is so high, having other things and difficult. What we always try to do is there is always opportunity to create seminars, to create other avenues, to build the soft skills of these young people. We don't train them on ignore our skills, we don't train them on private business and others. So doctors 
generally it's going to be you have a chance for services. And we are always looking for grants where the lawyers will do it as cutely. We will be writing prescriptions after Sunday, check services and all that. Go we'll bring your car to our CM. Get their case and say, we let them come and see you in the high seat of your then you will be charged in the lawyer office. These are things we do and we will encourage the public. Probably to have a continuous on um, health in that good run from the West so that at that level they can build the security for the chain. Thank you very much. You see, GMB can put together with Ghana Health Service and the teaching of the can organize some seminars. And some of us are still at um, Professor Head at QIST has run the hospital before. Some of us have run. We'll give you not what we go and learn at arms is theoretical. We'll give you pure practical things that are basic. Because I can tell you, I know the all the, the thinking of every of the work, every worker professional in the What the administrators are looking for, what the uh, accountants are looking for. And then we medical suits go and sit down. They will tell you, you go to theater. The time you will be signing checks is when you are entering theater. <laughs> you will make sure that you are strong. And then you will get the desk that will give you a towel, you clean your hands, and then stay in bed, and then you sign the check. But saying, Charlie, you are there for hours. But if you have that, everybody, everything will be in the office. After you have done my job at four o'clock, you go back and do the job. And seriously, there are some medical subordinates who don't even do clinical work. They will be sitting there, maybe we went to one hospital, and he said that they told me before we went there, they told me that the medical subordinate is only tea that he needs. <laughs> and when we went there, too, he was in office drinking tea. But so if you are a medical subordinate and you are not actively practicing, then it must. Because some of us have been chief chief executives and do the cooperative food that we change. They are here. I have a, I had a, I had a team. I was in TV. I trained health officers, resident, medical student. On Mondays is my theater day. You can't get me. You can only get me after 4 p.m. when I finish. If you are actively working, and then you bump me to all the other places at all hours, where you can go and see people smoking this. That's where they will know that the chief will be coming. Medical students will be entering here. They don't know the time will come. Hmm. And that to me is the way that it works. Okay. And then make sure that by Friday you know all the accounts that is coming into the system. By Monday morning you know where you are going to be and who you are not going to be. Okay. If you don't do that, you always do. You okay. never get it. Okay. And somebody will be getting the money and building it. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. That's so, yeah. sorry. You have so much yeah. experience. So we will give the last word to the president. Yes. Uh, At least uh, the president of TMA, I have not seen him drinking tea the secretary in a long time. Oh, the yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. I, I think it's, uh, it's been good. Um, but let me assure the point that TMA is uh, actually working on this mentorship program. We are also working on this mental health issues that was raised and we have a committee in place. Hopefully we'll come out with the updates. The leadership issues we are pushing to get the office to some positions to ensure that at least we lead because it's always better to have a doctor in charge. And let me say some of our seniors in the Ghana Health Service are helping us in that direction. And so it's something that we are doing and we are actually doing and we continue to push. My appeal is to Dr. Insias MD. So, my issue is that one of these hospitals, now we give it to the police hospital, uh, to the prison service. Look at it. Because prison service have no facility anywhere in the country. And we only have police hospital. COB is here, police hospital here, police hospital there, military hospital here, military hospital there. At least all of them do not have aspect of mandates. The prison service that I'm asking you to So, when we find one, the I don't know what is going to talk about. So, in fact, the one at the West is at the prison side. 
So that's so that's you, where you, the, the hospital will be. The prison gave us our ten dollars. So we can take it to them. So you see, our president uh, once in a while, since he took over from former president Rollins to boom once in a while. He's also a compassionate man. Let's give you the clap. <laughs> okay, um, Richard, let, just uh, do, there's, there was this a hand that has been up since the beginning, and I think it's only fair so to give him please, uh, a chance to say what he wants to say. Thank you. Yes, please thank you. Right. So the last person who has a question, I told you to talk my question concerning the fact that it was. Uh, I realized that there was a lot of process of the agenda one one. But uh, I went to when I joined the hospital, there was this story building yeah. Yes. This is not the same way. Uh, private entities came to build co attention to easy to put. I'm sure that if we keep the opportunity. Young ladies, young ladies, young people can very similar stories. Let's go find out what is the government policy concerning some of these. Uh, secondly, oh. this month the Ghana has initiated. I've been doing a number of CPGs trying to certify the doctors on when it comes to setting the animals for the patients. The money going to be severely uh, And if you look at some of the facilities that are able to handle these conditions, essentially they all will be an extensive interview. Not like the time we've been able to come to the ages. We brought the access all the information. Meanwhile, as our work in mind, that was great. We had to stop the work. How, as a doctor, are we supposed to get some of these care to those who work in public when they are hit by this condition? What is the government policy concerning all of you for putting together some of these in place to make sure when you have these and other conditions, places that are close to the ground, we can also have that. Thank you. Chair, let me give you indulgence to. We have an online community also listening. I'll keep one question from there and then we go. The main frame among the questions is Dr. Sansan. One, how sure are we that we finish all these projects before 20, January 2025? That's the question, right? And what is the guarantee that it will continue? Especially since the number of the old hospitals began previously are still yet to be used. So please. If you can address that so that our online community wants to feel thank you. In the first place, I don't see any old water to which it has been used. What I hear about them with I don't understand. Tema, there is a project going on, Tema Hospital. And it's been written. And you see, when you, you go to IM, things slow down. Now, after the debt restructuring this thing, the Paris from the city are signed, and people are suddenly coming back to finish all these buildings. The Eurogen project, what is left to be done is, I think, Salada Hospital. As we speak now, uh, the military of the so they go back to work. So, we, and I say that the money to be used are different sources of money. So, you have to let the persons there. The group is doing it so come back and finish the food. So I can assure you that I 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 Okay. 
So for free, we could comment that. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. They take home men, they home men, they home men, they home men. They take the last, the last one. They take the last, 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 the last
We are working with other stakeholders to try to set up structures and systems so that when asked then we want to travel to gain experience of the high residents and fellows want to travel to gain experience, they will not be put to the same criteria as other people that have been And these of us will be fully utilized in the application process. We are hoping to your feedback and suggestions for recommendations as we keep to work together to support healthcare. Once again, thank you very much for everything that you do back home. We know that the pain is not enough. And so as part of that, there's a one more monthly we should look at the compensation packages again. But we know that the work we do is to replace it. Let's take care of our physical health, our mental health, our spiritual health. Because if we are not strong and healthy enough, we cannot take care of those who are in the hospital. Thank you and congratulations. So when I was listening to the little speech, the only thing I had is the process. Then, so I uh, just want to tell all of you that the process, the process for this morning's session it's almost ready to end. And I'm going to give you a show that. <laughs> so uh, at least I didn't say that like, like, like what we do. But uh, we put the other one we should do. So uh, we will go for lunch. Uh, I know it's been a long day, but thank you. And President Marcelo and Club, because we 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 admire the fact that a lot of us have come in, built a stay uh, in the past. Sometimes you used to see some people free, free. I mean, in a sleepy way. Uh, but we see people from essays seriously awake. I've seen various people seriously awake paying attention, but. It's not in vain. We've all stayed engaged and made the program what it is. It's been a very successful one. Let's clap for ourselves once again. Um, we'll be going for lunch. After the lunch, we'll have a short session where we engage the candidates for our election. You know, this, this, this one is an election meeting. We have to do and choose those who will lead us. Uh, I'm also a candidate. But please, do me easy for my guys. And I'm a young child. Mm -hmm. And we would have a short session after which we would go to conference second uh, The president has made the match already. So we play some tickets on the party. And we gave a grip not to win the match. Uh, it was a willing agreement. So we gave them as win the match. But there are justices provided and they are trying to make some arrangement for goods. But if you have some goods or something you can play with, please, uh, there will be masses available to convey us to the Monday School Park. It's actually not too far, right? And it's near Vienna. When I said Vienna, some of the young guys at the back are excited. If, uh, you have a reason to be excited. And then uh, in the evening, we we'll have a cocktail. So in the afternoon session, we'll tell you the venue. And then where all that will happen. So thank you so much for today. And then we'll let Dr. Justice Adam close us with a prayer. The lunch will be for 45 minutes only. So eat it fast, 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 fast. And then we can come back and finish the manifesto session. If we don't finish fast, we'll present quickly and we can say nobody question us. Thank you. We are praying. Heavenly Father, we thank you for a successful A chance to keep our heart, a God to glorify, a never dying soul to save and be it for the sky. To serve the present age, my calling to fulfill. Oh, may it all my powers and gain to do my master's work. Arm me with generous pain, ask in thy sight to live. Oh, thy servant's Lord, prepare. A straight account to give. 
help me be watch and pray, and on thy self rely. Assured, if I my trust in thee, I shall forever die. This is what we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. So please, for lunch, there's some provision on the terrace, and then some to descend the stairs and go towards the blue side, so that you can spread us this night. Thank you so much. God bless you. Sorry, I, my poem is a big sign of life. Please enjoy your lunch. See, see, hi. Sound check. No sound check. Sound check. Sound check. Sound check. Sound check. La jungle, was a deep Thank you. 